this time, Daryl LaMonica, a rookie from Notre Dame, has replaced the injured Jack Kemp. Buffalo Clay. Yep, they did. LaMonica's 76-yard pass to Glenn Bass takes care of that. Now it's Buffalo's turn. LaMonica, 35 yards. Cookie Gilchrist down the receiving end. A pair of Capoletti field goals later, LaMonica passes 93 yards to the Bunyan. And the Bills fans have hope. And they have even more hope when LaMonica rolls out and fires a two-point conversion pass. Late in the third period, quarterback Darrell LaMonica takes personal charge. LaMonica passes to the Binion, good for 15 yards. Then LaMonica heaves a 56-yard beauty to the Binion, and the game is tied. Then a 21-yarder to Ernie Warwick to the Houston 49. This time, Darrell fakes and runs to the 33. LaMonica rolls from the 14 to the 3. Yeah, I think it's Bobby. Uh, he just helped us tremendously. After Burnett's clutch catch on the one, Daryl LaMonica crash dives over to tie the Chargers. Kemp maneuver aimed at restoring racehorse speed at the flank of post, and in turn a deep scoring threat. The Bills traded for Bo Roberson, the Oakland Raiders sprinter. Bo was a lifesaver. Here he takes a Daryl LaMonica pass, 74 yards for a touchdown against Houston. Roberson will play with Miami next year. One touchdown away from a new scoring record, Daryl LaMonica picks out Jack Spikes for the 18-yard aerial. The Bills' 58 points while setting a team mark is just one point shy of the league record, and quite forcefully puts Buffalo in the winning column. Buffalo's one-two punch at work. A fake to Carlton draws in the linebacker, giving Burnett a quick opening for the tally. Bobby with a score tied, Del LaMonica replaces Jack Kemp, and LaMonica immediately hits the Benyon with a 38-yard pass. On a key third and 11 situation, LaMonica scoots up the middle to the 12. 15-10 into the fourth period. Oakland inch closer in another Mercer field goal, but LaMonica goes to the speedy Albert to Bunyan on this 44-yard hookup. Gogolak's conversion makes it 21. Now with pressure from Dave Costa and Dan Birdwell, LaMonica clicks with the dangerous Albert to Bunyan, and it goes 10-7. Hi, I'm Bill LaMonica. m and and I hope you have enjoyed the highlights of the 1964 championship season. I'm confident 1965 will be another fine year for the Bills. I think our club will be even better, and that we'll defend our championship in an exciting manner. The Raider passing and receiving corps will have some new faces in 1967 with the addition to the roster of quarterback Darrell LaMonica and spread end Glenn Bass, both of whom became Raiders in an off-season trade with Buffalo for Flores and Powell. In addition, the veteran Mickey Slaughter, formerly at Denver, will compete along with Davidson and Green for the starting quarterback job. <laughs> guy whose ability to throw deep surpasses all others, and it's Daryl LaMonica. Twice, he threw over 30 touchdowns in a 14-game season. In LaMonica's right arm, a football became an explosive weapon, and that's why he was known as the Mad Bomber. On a Monday night game, Howard Cosell, I think, nicknamed me that uh, because at that particular year I threw so many touchdown passes outside the 30-yard line, and I didn't like it at first. You know, it just it had, like, you know, throwing the ball crazy. But then I thought about it, and I really utilized it as a tool. 
uh, to put a little fear in the defensive secondary. I remember I can look out at a cornerback and just stare at him until he made eye contact. If I could get him to back up two steps, I knew I had him. By reducing enemy game plans to rubble, the Mad Bomber demonstrated that his nickname was richly deserved. Mad Bomber, they named him right. He was going after it. I mean, he went back and he unloaded that ball. He wanted to go for, for broke every play. First and ten from his own one, he's going for the touchdown. Third and ten from your eight, he's going for the touchdown. I mean, this guy would stand back and you could see him from the sideline. When he was going deep, it looked like he stood taller. And when he threw the thing, I mean, it was like shooting an arrow in the air. It didn't look like it was going to ever come down. And you'd swear that when he threw it, it slipped out of his hand. God, could he gun that thing. Uh, you know, it just wore our defensive backs out because every other play, down the field, you know, Warren Wells deep, Fred Bletnikoff deep, Warren Wells deep again. It never stopped. There was no stadium in the league that could hold Daryl LaMonica. He had the ability to just light it up. He got hot. My God. And he started throwing that football. He, he had an electricity to him. Our players could feel that in the huddle. He got it, and they knew when he got it. Look out, buddy, because he's going to hand it to you. And I think this is a great thing that he had. This, he just accomplished so much because he, he could throw that football. Over a six-year span that began in 1967, LaMonica threw 145 touchdown passes, more than any quarterback in pro football during this period. This two-time All-AFL selection possessed a keen understanding of passing strategy. Let you go. And he was well aware that being a flying ace made him a sitting duck. I got nicknamed a Mad Bomber, and as all quarterbacks, I'd like to throw in a few of those shorter passes too, and not taking the hits because it takes still 3.4 seconds to throw the ball deep. Gives that defensive end one more stride, and when he hits you, he really unloads on you, and your body can only take so many of those hits. To throw the deep ball, have to throw it well. You have to be very courageous in that pocket. You have to be willing to hold the ball a little long. That's one thing with Al. You know, he always wants the ball up the field, up the field. Well, you know, that was perfect for Darrell because Darrell liked to get the ball up the field. And Darrell did an excellent job at it. I believed in that philosophy, and we won with that philosophy. LaMonica applied this philosophy with devastating efficiency. Mad Bomber's ability to hit his targets enabled Oakland to zero in on victory. From 1967 to 1972, LaMonica was at the controls as the Raiders won 80% of their games and compiled the best record in pro football. LaMonica piloted his team to four consecutive AFL title games and one Super Bowl. championship proved elusive and many have failed to appreciate the fact that there was a method to this bomber's madness i think darrell was the most underrated of the starting quarterbacks that the raiders had uh, he never got enough credit he had a great arm he was a picture thrower he looked good throwing the ball and he could really sing it out there when darrell lamonica ordered bombs away he proved the supremacy of air power and took the Raiders to glorious heights.
Juan Wells on a long gain into Fred Bulletnikov. In 1968, they became an undisputed powerhouse, gaining more yards and scoring more points than any other professional football team. And they did it with style. The offense was phenomenal too, gaining over 600 yards. And the Raiders beat the coming Cincinnati. From then on, the Bengals never had a chance. It was a must win to force a play. By the half, both teams had scored, but San Diego led 13-10. The other by Fred Belitnikoff. The 82-yard game by Belitnikoff was the longest non-scoring play in Raider history. Football. And abandoned their strength. Ball control. The plan worked perfectly. The very first time Oakland got the ball. The last play of the first quarter was a post pattern to the Nikoff. And before the Chiefs knew what hit them, they trailed 21 to nothing. With only 28 seconds left in the first half, Fred Bolitnikov took the game completely out of reach. it was was just superior effort by one of football's most deceptive flankers. The moves made on all pro safety Johnny Robinson were phenomenal. But the rest, that was pure desire. LaMonica closed the margin with a strike to Belitnikov. But Oakland trailed all the way to the fourth quarter. John Madden became head coach in 1969 and faced the awesome challenge of maintaining the Raiders' winning ways. He met the challenge in 69 with pro football's best record, 12-1-1. LaMonica then threw the Dolphins with this 13-yard pass to Fred Belitnikoff that put the Raiders up 17-7. From any place on the field, any play can be six points. Another on Daryl LaMonica's pass to Fred Belitnikov. Still, the end result was a frustrating 20-20 tie. In the third quarter, LaMonica threw to number 25, league-leading receiver Fred Belitnikov. LaMonica's second touchdown pass was also directed toward Belitnikov. The boys' Raider quarterback found life pleasant behind his excellent offensive line. And number 25, Fred Belitnikov, took his turn in the end zone. LaMonica's first half statistics appeared unreal. 17 completions for 275 yards and six touchdowns. And on to devastate Buffalo with six touchdown passes in the first half and the Raiders remained undefeated. On the first play following Denver's kickoff, Darrell LaMonica threw a 53-yard touchdown pass to Fred Belitnikov. In the third quarter, Fred Belitnikov continued to befuddle Denver's young secondary. His touchdown catch put the Raiders ahead by three touchdowns. LaMonica and Belitnikov combined for their third touchdown of the game. Oakland's easy win kept them in second place, only a half game behind Kansas City in the AFL's competitive Western... While Mr. Nemeth received visitors all day, Mr. Belitnikov simply received. LaMonica responded by arching a pass to the AFL's leading receiver, Fred Belitnikov, for Oakland's first touchdown. This time for the right to play in the AFL championship game. 
La Monica to Bolitnikov. Make it 7-0 early. And then, of course, there was the old Raider string, the passing combination of Daryl LaMonica to Fred Belitnikoff, which was good for two more touchdowns. The autumn wind is a pirate, blustering in from sea. Two minutes and five seconds later, LaMonica passed to Fred Belitnikoff, number 25, for another touchdown. Oakland answered with catches by Belitnikov that set up two Charlie Smith touchdowns and tied the score at 17. Any play can be six points. Another on Daryl LaMonica's pass to Fred Belitnikov. Both these quarterbacks performed as champions in perhaps the finest and roughest game of the year. Oakland was now behind, and they just could not afford to be behind this late in the game or this late in the season. Fred Belitnikov led a march that culminated in a game-tying touchdown. Lamonica went to Belitnikov, right over them. No miracles today, just mind and muscle, silver and black, and number one in the West for a record-breaking fourth straight champion. But the field hadn't dried, and the going was tough for both teams. At long last, the Oakland offense roared to life as number 28 Clarence Davis inspired the ground game. And Darryl LaMonica was his old self again as he and Fred Beletnikoff teamed for five receptions and two scores, which put the Raiders ahead 28 to nothing. Daryl LaMonica ignored an open Raymond Chester and instead hit number 25, Fred Boletnikov, for six points. And in this game, Fred Boletnikov became Oakland's all-time leading receiver with 262 receptions. Meanwhile, the Raider offense was, as usual, that sterling silver and black combination of LaMonica to Fred Boletnikov. The Raiders countered with their old standby, Daryl to Fred. Simple but effective, as Fred was quick to point out to number 22, D'Artagnan Martin. When Daryl LaMonica threw the league-leading receiver, Fred Boletnikoff, in the end zone. Against the NFC's top-ranked pass defense, Boletnikov managed six receptions. A little over 11 minutes remaining in the first half. The Raiders out in front, three to nothing. They step again. Another Boletnikov, Fred Boletnikov, and hit by Willie Alexander. Well, he continues to throw, and right now it's working for him. He had one-on-one -on -one coverage on this side. You saw he did send Smith out of the backfield, which brought Webster, the linebacker, out with him. He curled it back in. You see Belitnikov, 25, will come out. He's going to run just a turn in or a curl. And hopefully right in front of him, if he catches the ball, you'll see that Webster, number 90, the linebacker, has been brought out of his position by Smith. Not a good idea, though. I agree with you, Frank. From their own 44, following the holding penalty, Monica with the strong arm goes to Belitnikov. Turn, look here, Daryl. Daryl, this way. Going for Belitnikov, who's open. He's got it. Fred Belitnikov, getting behind number 19, Willie Alexander. Oh, boy. Talk about a giveaway at seven points. Well, we can look back and see a lot of those things, but Livikov just takes off. He gets right behind Alexander. It's a perfectly thrown ball.
fall by La Monica, incidentally. Boy, that's where bump and run hurts if you don't know how to handle it. Look at that Belinda company. He's been in the end zone before. Then Darrell LaMonica unleashed the lightning. It struck 30 yards to Fred Boletnikoff with 6.30 gone. The Raiders led 21 to nothing. The first time they got the ball, the Raiders put together a long scoring drive led by number 25 Fred Boletnikoff's catches. Darrell LaMonica went to his class receiver, Fred Belitnikoff, to regain the lead. <laughs> Meanwhile, number 23, Charlie Smith. However, this time, it was only seven yards good for seven points to Fred Belitnikoff, which made it 37 to 13. <laughs> so often the Raiders hit the Lightning Brigade from San Diego with a bolt of their own. And the LaMonica to Bolitnikoff bomb put Oakland ahead again. It'll be on to Miami and the undefeated Dolphins. On first and ten, LaMonica. And he's going up in the air to Bolitnikoff and he's open. He got it. That one was thrown right on the money. I guarantee he could not have been better thrown. Come back, he's trying to help him. Oh, split screen, let's watch it again. The Mad Bombers, he called, really unleashed that one. And look at the Lender call. Right out in front of Tennant. Now look at him. Never, never broke stride. It appears that Tennant is sliding and he may have, no, I don't, he may have hurt one of his shoulder that we mentioned earlier. Late in the fourth quarter, LaMonica put up Oakland's only touchdown with an old-fashioned bomb to Fred Boletnikoff. The autumn wind is a pirate. the season at home with convincing wins over Denver and Boston, the Raiders immediately found themselves in a critical must-win situation. The undefeated Kansas City Chiefs, defending league champions, came to the Coliseum. The early season showdown brought a crowd of more than 50,000. Oakland's defense made it an important play early in the game. Safety Roger Bird intercepted Glenn Dawson's pass. Quickly, Darrell LaMonica passed to Clem Daniels, the halfback, for a score. The Raiders held just a three-point lead as the second half began. And they saw it threatened when linebacker Bobby Bell intercepted deep in Oakland territory. But as it did so often in 1967, the defense turned the momentum. Mike Lassiter and Dan Connors teamed up on a big, big play. Lassiter made the hit. Connors grabbed the ball and thundered 49 yards to the Chiefs' 27. Oakland had to settle for a field goal, but the momentum which had been Kansas City now belonged to the Raiders. The Chiefs, though, were far from finished as Mike Garrett hit Otis Taylor for a score.
It remained for LaMonica to bring the Oakland offense back with the clincher late in the game. Daniels, fine run, set it up. On an unusual tight end screen, fine blocks by Wayne Hawkins and Fred Belitnikoff enabled Billy Cannon, 1959 Heisman Trophy winner from LSU, to score. Narrowly 23-21. A vital part of the Raider win was the excellent work of the special teams, controlling lightning fast Nolan Smith, the Chiefs' punt and kickoff return specialist. Tough rookies, Dwayne Benson of Hamlin, Bob Cruz of Wayne State, Bill Fairban of Colorado, and veterans Ken Herrock of West Virginia, Bill Budness of Boston University, Jim Harvey of Mississippi, and Carlton Oates of Florida AM were among top special teams performers. After their only loss of the season, a 27-14 thumping administered in New York by Joe Namath and the Jets, the Raiders moved on to Buffalo for the second leg of the difficult Eastern Tour. In retrospect, the game was perhaps the most pivotal of the season. Another loss would have dropped Oakland two full games behind unbeaten San Diego. On the other hand, a victory would put the club's record at 4-1 and, and keep pressure on the Chargers. A record crowd was in War Memorial Stadium to see former Buffalo quarterback Darrell LaMonica Bill veteran Bill signal caller Jack Kemp. Instead, they saw a battle between two outstanding defensive units. Now nicknamed the 11 Angry Men by a New York journalist, the Oakland defense put on an awesome display. The front four with the assistance of linebackers Gus Otto of Missouri, Bill Lasky of Michigan, and Dan Connors of Miami made Kemp's afternoon a long one. This punt return by Roger Bird and a subsequent pass to Fred Bolitnikoff enabled the Raiders to lead 10-7. Less than two minutes to play in the half, Kemp ran into trouble near his own goal line, and Dan Connors turned it into a TD and a 10-point lead. In the third period, the Bills narrowed the gap on a play strikingly similar to the Connors interception. 290-pound Jim Dunaway rumbled to the Oakland three-yard line. And it was Keith Lincoln who scored. With the Bills pressing to take control of the game and trailing by just three points, safety Howie Williams made his most important interception of the season. Under LaMonica's direction, the Raiders turned it into a score. later hit X-Raider Art Powell for a touchdown, but too late, and Oakland tucked away a very large victory. A week later in Boston, defendable Roger Hagberg came off the bench, scored a pair of touchdowns, and sparked the Raiders to a 48-14 victory that completed a successful Eastern trip. Raider offensive guard Wayne Hawkins, an off-season member of the staff of the Oakland Bank of Commerce, is seen here with bank president Carol Weaver who has led not only the destinies of the Oakland Bank of Commerce as they have helped build the East Bay and Bay Area, but many important business firms in the area. The Oakland Bank of Commerce is a full-service bank in every respect, and as pro football has its specialists, Coach Weaver insists that members of the bank staff know something about the business of its customers. Thus, bank officers and staff members know not only the people they do business with, but something about that business. You are watching as various bank officers consult with officials of some of the business establishments they have helped build and continue to build. Whether it's a loan to expand or financing in a foreign country 
for helping to guide the Oakland Raiders Boosters Club. The Oakland Bank of Commerce and its staff are there, continuing to help build not only the East Bay, but the Bay Area as well. The Oakland Bank of Commerce. returned home winners in five of their first six games, trailing division-leading San Diego, who were still unbeaten but once tied. The battle for first place between the two bitter California rivals was sold out several days before kickoff. A record crowd of 53,474 turned out in balmy 70-degree weather. After the Raiders had scored first on a safety by Dan Birdwell, LaMonica and Clem Daniels hooked up on a picture pass play for a Raider touchdown. Roger Bird and his teammates on the Raider punt return unit made an important contribution. But Corbin Comet, a first-round draft choice in 1966, blasted up the middle for 78 yards. Monica later scored and Oakland led 16-3, but the Chargers proved their explosiveness on the very first play after the kickoff as the legendary Lance Allworth took a perfectly thrown pass from John Hadle. The Oakland effort that day featured, among other things, three pass interceptions by quarterback Dave Grayson, the veteran from Oregon, who had replaced Willie Brown, injured in the second quarter. Throughout 1967, when John Rouch went to the Oakland bench, he picked winners. Time after time, replacements for injured starters came up with important, and in some cases, game-winning plays. Raider offense also stood out on a day that was all open. Kurt Beletnikov made a great catch. And Clem Daniels ripped off his longest run of the season. had a pass intercepted. But that situation was put right and in a hurry by Warren Wells. The final was Oakland 51, San Diego 10. The Lakers were the new Western Division leaders with six victories and only one defeat. The Silver and Black extended its win string to five and moved the season mark to eight and one with tough victories over Denver and Miami. Despite their glittering record, the Raiders couldn't put daylight between themselves and San Diego. The Chargers remained just a half game back of Oakland, but the Raiders scheduled to face the powerful Kansas City Chiefs Thanksgiving Day in Kansas City. Opening in place of all-league halfback Clem Daniels, who was injured four days earlier against the Miami Dolphins, second-year pro Pete Banizak of Miami University proved equal to the challenge, as did Larry Todd, who backed up Banizak later in the year. Fred Belotnikov had a big day, as did most of Oakland's offense. secondary of ex-Nebraska sprint star Kent McClure and Grambling's Willie Brown at corners and Roger Bird, Warren Powers, Howie Williams and Dave Grayson sharing duties at safety made a sizable contribution to the defensive effort that day. Brown and Powers each had touchdown interceptions. And the rest of the Oakland defense added to its string of outstanding performances.
The Chiefs managed some spectacular offense, but not enough as Oakland kept winning. This time, 44-22. The Raiders had won 9 of 10, but San Diego dogged their heels with a come-from-behind win over Denver. The Turkey Day wins by the Raiders and Chargers set the stage for one of the most important games of the 67 season. A record crowd packed San Diego's plush new stadium to watch the AFL's hottest rivalry, Oakland versus San Diego, in a moment of truth battle. As in Oakland, stakes were first place in the West. The Raiders scored first after a 75-yard march that featured good blocking in the offensive line by tackles Bob Suez of USC and Harry Shue of Memphis State. Fred Boletnikov caught the touchdown pass. The score was tied when on third and short yardage, Oakland fooled the Charger defense. La Monica to Cannon. Down by 10, the dangerous Chargers came tearing back. Hadel to the great Lance Alwyn. The remainder of the half was a whirlwind of action. Oakland raced to a 31-14 lead after a Willie Brown interception. And a pass to Hewlett Dixon. Both of these plays preceded later touchdowns. Chargers, though, weren't quitting, and a wild first half ended with the Raiders in doubtful command, 31 to 21. Perhaps dismayed that they had allowed the Chargers 21 first half points, the Oakland defense stiffened and shut out San Diego the rest of the afternoon. In the meantime, the offense put the cap around another important victory. More than 5,000 Raider fans made the journey south to watch Oakland win 41 to 21. Their trip was a happy one. Visions of a title hovered over the East Bay. Oakland was 10 and 1 and led San Diego by a game and a half with just three to play. The Raiders finished their road campaign the following week against a rising young Houston Oilers team, which was in the process of completing one of the most remarkable turnabouts in AFL history. Last in their division in 1966, Houston was about to overtake New York at the top of the Eastern standings. In the thick of their own title fight, badly wanting to knock off the rocketing Raiders, the Oilers reached an emotional peak on a chilly, dreary day in Rice Stadium. Near the close of the first half, Pete Feather connected with fullback Coyle Granger for the score. Oakland trail at half, seven to nothing. After Willie Brown stopped another Houston threat with an interception, the Raiders offense went to work and cranked up a seemingly interminable 17-play drive that ended in their first score of the day. A short field goal by George Blank. lead was 7-3, and from Miami came news that San Diego trailed the Dolphins. Another Raider drive, and another Blanda field goal. Oakland inched closer, 7-6. Miami still led the Chargers. Literally smelling the money, the 11 angry men became nearly impregnable. In the raw night air, the game turned into a grim battle, reducing itself to basic football, strength against strength.
Orlando once again found the range, and the Raiders finally led. Nine to seven. Miami had increased its lead over San Diego. Houston had the ball but three plays before Dan Connor stole a pass. The offense, and Hewitt Dixon took over. Touchdown, Oakland. Miami was now comfortably ahead of the Chargers, and the dedicated Silver and Black Raiders were moments away from a Western Division championship. George Wanda closed the door on his old teammates with another field goal, his fourth of the day. The Raiders won 19-7, and the win streak stretched to eight in a row. Minutes after the game, the San Diego defeat was announced, and the Raiders were officially champions of the West. Their own division race finished. The Raiders closed out the season at home against the New York Jets and Buffalo Bills. They won both games to run their season's record to an amazing 13-1, best in league history. In the Jets game, the Raider defense had its hands full with New York's brilliant quarterback, Joe Namath. Earlier in the year, Namath had been instrumental in beating the Raiders. The game featured some great Raider defense. That included a crucial goal line stand. That also included these two important second half plays by linebacker John Robert Williamson, both of which led to touchdowns. offense was aided by fine blocking. This is won by Warren Wells on a long gainer to Fred Bulletnikov. Now good blocking efforts in the offensive line by top draftee Gene Upshaw and all-league guide Wayne Hawkins on a tough run by Pete Banizak. <laughs> The Raiders' victory margin was 39 to 28. One week later, John Rogers' men decisioned the Buffalo Bills 28 to 21. On New Year's Eve 1967, Pro Football's young and dynamic organization, the Silver and Black Oakland Raiders, played the Houston Oilers for the championship of the eight-year-old American Football League. Pre-game speculation centered around the question of Oakland's ability to score on a defense that had allowed the fewest points of any team in pro football. On the other hand, could the 11 angry men check the freight train rushes of fullback Royal Granger and Woody Campbell? Houston kicked off to the Raiders, and those questions began to be answered. A first period Oiler drive was stopped when Dan Carter stole a pass right out of the arms of Alvin Reed. The Oilers could gain a little ground against the characteristically stubborn Oakland defense. Two important second quarter plays turned a close game into a comfortable Raider lead. Oakland's great eight-time All-League center Jim Otto made an important block on Hewitt Dixon's 69-yard touchdown gallop. The Raiders got another drive going, but with seconds remaining in the half, seemed forced to settle for an attempt at three points. The field goal alignment, though, was a fraud. Lamonica instead passed to Dave Kosurik for a touchdown and a halftime lead of 17 to nothing. Mike Eishide continued to punt as he had throughout the season with distance and accuracy. Oakland dominated the second half as they had the first, and the afternoon belonged to the Raiders and their fans. The final was 40 to seven. Losers of 19 straight games in 1961 and 62, the once pitiful Raiders had become the unquestioned champions of the American Football League. The 53,330 who sat so comfortably that afternoon in the Coliseum to watch a tough, single-minded, carefully constructed football apparatus dismantle the Houston Oilers was a far cry from the handful who short years before had watched the Raiders play in temporary homes. 
Those loyal fans who had supported the club from the beginning deserved a championship, perhaps more than any other fans in the history of sports. Then it was on to Miami as the AFL champion Oakland Raiders flew east on their chartered United Airlines DC-8. The Raiders, like nine of the ten AFL teams, fly the friendly skies of United. In the second AFL-NFL World Championship game, the Raiders met the monarchs of professional football, the Green Bay Packers. Each team's offense scored two touchdowns, but the differences were four Packer field goals and costly Oakland mistakes. had their moments, including two scoring passes to Split and Bill Miller, but not enough of them. And Green Bay, as it had done so consistently in its own league, won decisively 33-14. to Despite the loss to Green Bay, 1967 will be remembered as a great season. John Roush was named the AFL's Coach of the Year. He was assisted by this outstanding staff. Defensive line coach Tom Doms, an All-American at San Diego State. Linebacker coach John Madden, an all-conference tackle at Cal Poly. Coach of the defensive secondary, Charlie Sumner, a brilliant offensive back at William & Mary. Ollie Spencer, a former Kansas University great, coaches the Raider offensive line, and John Polanchek, who starred at Michigan State, is the offensive backfield coach. George Anderson is among the top trainers in sports, and Dick Romanski, once a little All-American quarterback, is the team's equipment manager. Team doctor Ken Small, who has been with the Raiders since 1960, completes the club's on-the-field staff. With the winning of their first AFL championship, the Raiders reached a plateau. In 1963, Al Davis, now managing owner, came to Oakland dedicated to the development of the Raiders as the finest organization in professional sports. Excellent progress has been made. Now, in 1968, the Silver and Black again prepare to assume their role as the standard bearer of this great East Bay community. The rivalries of the American Football League have become fierce and violent. They have turned friendships into hostilities. 1968 will be the most difficult in the club's nine-year history. The Chargers, the Jets, the Chiefs, the Oilers, and the rest of the AFL teams will be taking their best shot at the champions, the Raiders of Oakland. It is more difficult to defend the title than to win it. Al Davis has said the challenge ahead is a tremendous one. But no matter how great that challenge, the Oakland Raiders intend to meet it, as usual, with pride and points. shaving system and the dry look hair groom for men. Gillette, first in its league, first with men for almost 75 years. There are two roads to a football title. One, outscore everybody. Two, prevent the other team from scoring. The Houston Oilers, with an opportunistic young defense, gave up fewer points than any team in American Football League history. The pass interception was their home run. They had to play defense. Their offense was eighth in a nine-team league. Their quarterback, Pete Bethard, didn't put on a Houston uniform till midseason. He adapted quickly. 
Their halfback, Woody Campbell, was a rookie, picked 242nd in the college draft. But he developed into a star. And unknown in 1966, fullback Hoyle Granger became the league's second best rusher. Thus a devastating defense, a late developing offense provided Houston with their Eastern Division title. The Oakland Raiders traveled a somewhat different route to their title. They played great defense. They dropped enemy quarterbacks a league record 67 times. Very few teams could run on their huge front four. Or pass against their cat quick secondary. But Oakland's strongest point was their offense, guided by player of the year Darrell LaMonica. In his first year as a starting quarterback, LaMonica led the league in passing. He tossed for 30 touchdowns. Strangely enough, his favorite receiver was the fullback, Hewitt Dixon, who's also a punishing runner. Pairing with Dixon was Pete Banaszak, a young bullish halfback from Miami who took over when all league Clem Daniels broke his leg. The combination was deadly enough to score more points than any team in the league as Oakland won an AFL record 13 games in the Western Division crown. But when the best of the East meets the best of the West, the results are one-sided. Why? new Coliseum fills to capacity. More than 53,000 fans enter the modern stadium, most of them confident that the Raiders will win their first American Football League title. The mood is festive. Raiders have won 10 in a row, including a late season 19-7 victory over the Houston Oilers. The Oakland players radiate confidence as they warm up. After beating every team in the league at least once, the Raiders seem relaxed and well prepared. Head coach Johnny Rauch is counting on his young passer, Daryl LaMonica. Houston's quarterback is Pete Bethard who, like LaMonica, is finishing his first season as a starter. On these two somewhat untested arms will depend much of the outcome of this eighth American Football League championship game. Our entire Oakland Raider uh, team was really well uh, prepared for the ball, ball game. We were very confident, and especially our defense. We felt that uh, we could hold her uh, running to a minimum and that we could hold them uh, 10 points or less. We knew that if we could stop Grand Jay, who is one of the best fullbacks in our league, that we could contain him pretty well. And how they stop Grand Jay. Every time number 32 touches the pigskin, 
There are black shirts to sit him down. Granger averaged more than five yards per carry during the season. His average for this game is slightly more than one yard per carry. By simply overpowering the Houston blockers, the Raiders limit the Oiler fullback to a sparse 19 yards gain. Halfback Woody Campbell fared no better. He was not permitted his heralded long gains. The entire Houston running attack, which led the league in 1967, was handcuffed with a mere 38 yards. Darrell LaMonica continues to explain the Oakland strategy. The real big problem was that if we could contain uh, Pete Bethard and keep Pete uh, from scrambling out of the pocket too much and then containing uh, the passing game. Again, the problem is successfully solved. Blanket coverage in the secondary. Pressure from the pass rush. They are Oakland's trademark. But the pass rush is not just to force a hurried throw. It also is designed to keep Pete Bethard from scrambling, to pin him inside the defensive ends and make him throw from a pocket. Or not to let him throw at all. When he does break free, the Raiders are there to smother any further game. Or make Bethard sorry he passed in the first place. The strategy works. The Oiler offense is neutralized. The league's top quarterback is ready to go to work. Our game plan was basically to, uh, to experiment a little bit. Uh, we felt that we could run on them as well as throw on them. And, of course, uh, I uh, probed a little bit to find the weaknesses that uh, I did find. I found uh, uh, to our left side, their defensive right side, we did find some weaknesses off tackle and on our, our sweeps to the left side. So quarterback never bites the hand uh, that feeds him, so I stayed at Proving LaMonica's strategy correct, Oakland's fine runners found plenty of room over Houston's defensive right side. With rookie guard Gene Upshaw, number 63, leading the way, Oakland's power sweeps battered Houston's right side for valuable yards. But there is more to LaMonica's analysis. We worked their middle over and uh, primarily our left side. We also had plays going to our right side as well, but uh, we felt that if I could establish a running game early in, in the game, that we would be fairly successful. The strategy is complete. The Raiders have their blueprint for victory. The record crowd joins coaches Johnny Roush of Oakland and Wally Lim of Houston, sharing the tenseness of the opening kickoff. The winner goes to Miami to represent the American Football League in the Super Bowl. The loser goes home. Oakland's Dave Grayson puts the Raiders in Houston territory. Now the probing begins. LaMonica sends his fullback, Hugh Ritt Dixon, into the middle of the Houston line. On second and six, LaMonica tests the Oilers' strength, their pass defense. Fred Bolitnikov is there for nine. At the Houston 31, the Raider quarterback continues to search for a weakness. The throw is incomplete. Oakland's probing offense can't penetrate any further. Former Oiler George Blanda tries a 38-yard field goal that sails off to the right. Still early in a scoreless game, Houston gains momentum. Pete Bethard, it's Woody Campbell for five. 
Bethard wants to keep the drive moving. He stays with his passing game. Charlie Frazier slips free for a first down on the Oakland 42. But the Houston delight is short-lived. Bethard begs to rookie Alvin Reed, who appears to have another first down, when Oakland linebacker Dan Connor steals the ball. The theft seems to dampen Houston's spirit. Another look at the same key play shows how Connors tackles the football. The daring maneuver pays off for the Raiders. And the Oilers' first scoring thrust is wiped out. Daryl LaMonica confidently begins to take charge. A bullet to Billy Cannon, who's wide open, gobbles up 21 yards. Raider coach Johnny Roush watches intently as the Oilers nearly match Oakland's earlier break. LaMonica's aerial is almost intercepted by Oiler rookie Ken Houston. A second look reveals the Houston safety has possession with a clear field ahead, but he drops the ball. If the rookie is upset, imagine how his coach feels. Oakland's George Blanda salvages three points from the drive. Boosting the Raiders to a 3-0 advantage after one period. If any quarter of any championship game started out with a bigger explosion, it has gone unnoticed. On the first play of the second period, a simple end sweep by Hewitt Dixon quickly becomes the longest run from scrimmage in AFL title game history. 69 yards to the final chalk mark. Another look at this record-setting play, a last-second decision by quarterback LaMonica, who recalls this situation. As the game progressed, I did notice that they were overloading when I went into a spread, as we call an ease formation, where I take and put both my outside receivers to the wide side of the field or the strong side of the field. I did this, and they overshifted, and uh, I got up to the line of scrimmage, and uh, they were giving us what we call a strong dog. They were bringing their strong backer, uh, Webster, and also uh, their middle linebacker. And so when I saw this, that I obliged out of the play that I had and, and called an end sweep. Uh, to the weak side or back into the short side of our field. We pack everybody down in the middle, we cut off their pursuit, and Pete Benazak made the real big key block on the play. He had the lead block, he chopped down their uh, linebacker. Gene Upshaw, our left guard, came out clean and turned it around. After that it was just clear sailing for Stuart Dixon, who is a great runner and showed his speed. The Raiders shock the Oilers with a 10-0 lead. Three more times, the Raider defense chokes off Houston drives, and Oakland regains possession the third time for keeps. Less than two and a half minutes to play in the half. The Raiders test the weakness they have found on Houston's defensive right side. Pete Banizak fights to near midfield. Then Dixon dances through white jerseys to the Oiler 41. A little more than a minute till halftime. Again, Dixon. Again, Houston's right side. And again, this time, Pete Banizak carries to the Oilers 17, where it's fourth and one with time running out. Now 
Now is the time to dig deep for that game breaker, the one play the enemy is not expecting. 18 seconds, and here comes Coach Rauch's decision. A fake field goal with LaMonica rolling out. Dave Kasurik is wide open, chased only by a Houston tackle, George Rice. Oiler coach Wally Lim calls it a key play. Darrell LaMonica tells how it happened. I felt that the coach made a very wise decision in saving the play for the time that uh, we did use it because it was a big surprise play and uh, of course Webster had overcommitted himself. He was coming in to block the field goal if he could and uh, he got out of position which allowed me to roll and get to the outside fairly clear. They just couldn't recover in time to uh, get to Dave Kasurik who I believe uh, made his first reception of the year. A big reception for seven points and uh, it gave us a tremendous advantage at halftime. It's Oakland, 17 to nothing. The Oilers know they must begin to make their move as the third period opens. Rookie Zeke Moore, the AFL's top man at kickoff returns, sets out on his specialty. But Dwayne Benson slams into Moore, popping the ball loose. Ken Herrock recovers for Oakland on the Houston 29. Fate has dealt the Oilers another disastrous blow. When a team is down, go for broke is LaMonica's theory after the Houston fumble. He unloads the bomb for Billy Cannon. It fails to explode. Back to the power sweep. Pete Banizak plays his blocks well, runs through a clothesline for 14 yards. Quarterback LaMonica is confident of his halfback. Pete Banizak is a very, very strong runner. He never gives up. He will use his blockers to the best advantage. An awful lot like Paul Horning, Green Bay Packers of the past. Uh, I felt that he was very similar, where he could set up his blocking and cut back against the grain and use them to the best advantage for him. From the Houston 7, LaMonica fakes to Banizak, then scrambles for a first down on the Oiler 2. An Oakland score here, and Houston's dreams of a title could vanish. Number 3 sizes up the Oiler defense. Then behind wedge blocking, LaMonica pushes himself into the end zone. The Raider balance is working to the tune of a 24 to nothing lead. Daryl LaMonica knows the Oilers must alter their attack. We knew that they would be putting the ball in the air, and of course, this was a big advantage as far as our defense was concerned. By doing this, it took away one of their real strengths, and that was their running game as far as their offense was concerned. And they had to go to their passing game, and then that let our defense pretty much tee off and play a little more reckless football and enable our uh, defensive secondary to anticipate what they were going to do. The Raiders capitalize on the advantage. Houston goes nowhere. Oakland plays ball control. Banizak zips up the middle to the Houston 41. Another look reveals Banizak's power and balance. He runs for 116 yards in this game. Leading 24 to nothing, LaMonica isn't content to simply stay on the ground. An aerial to Billy Cannon winds up on the Houston 32. A little more trickery with flanker Fred Belitnikoff, the intended hero. But Houston's Don Floyd is not fooled. The Oiler defense seems to be bracing for one final stand. LaMonica is chased out of the pocket. The result, an incomplete pass on a third and 13 situation. The AFL top scorer, George Blanda, hurries in to boot a 40-yard field goal. 
the Raider margin is nearly insurmountable, 27 to nothing after three quarters. Darrell LaMonica knows how Blanda enjoys beating his former mate. Any time that you do get traded from one ball club, it gives you an added incentive to go back and want to be at your best against that particular team and to beat that team. This was the case with George Blanda, not only during league play, where he kicked four field goals to beat Houston, but also in the championship game where he again kicked four field goals to help us defeat Houston in the real big game. George has a tremendous leg. He's a great kicker, but even more so, he's a great competitor. I can't stress this point enough on George because he plays only to win. And, uh, of course, in football, I think in anything, this is the only way to play it. He's uh, always in there, and he'll give you 100% at all times. Blanda's four field goals personally outscore the Oilers. In the final period, Houston mounts a drive. Sid Blank sweeps to the Raider 39. Rookie linebacker George Webster urges his club to score. Pete Bethard has the same idea, but it takes a pass interference penalty against Oakland's Dave Grayson at the five to set up the Oilers. Receiver Alvin Reed thought he had a touchdown, but that comes on the next play. Bethard flips to Charlie Frazier for the tally. The Oilers have a long way to go, trailing 30 to 7. Victory is just riding out the clock for Daryl LaMonica, Pete Banizak, and the Western Division champions. But that competitive spirit spurs LaMonica on to try for more points. Banizak continues to find running room on Houston's right side. At the Oiler 12, LaMonica counters to the defender's strength, their left side. Bill Miller is open for the score. A repeat of the touchdown shows how Oakland's two wide receivers cross. Fred Belitnikov split wide to the right with Bill Miller inside him. A perfect pass means six more points for the Raiders. As the seconds die into the Oakland night, the dream that brought Houston from last place in 1966 to first in 1967 ends abruptly, 40 to seven. The Raiders' blueprint for victory is a success as they enjoy their initial American Football League championship. For Oakland, a record-breaking season ends with a thrill, a title, and a trip. I think if anyone in the AFL has a chance to beat the Packers, it's definitely the Raiders, especially with a strong defensive team that they have. And I have all the faith in the world in La Monica. There's no getting us up. We'll be up, I'll tell you. It was, uh, we're that type of ball club. We've got a lot of pride. We're just going to go out and do our best. And, uh... Try to stay in the park with them. Hope they don't run us out of the park. Any professional football team can beat any other professional football team on any given day. And Oakland never lets down, and they always rise to the occasion in the second half, so I say they're going to win. Well, I think the Raiders can beat the Packers any day. The Raiders will win the Super Bowl, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Right, I think we'll show up for the game, all right, I hope. The Raiders are going to get killed. Raiders are going to smear the Packers. The Raiders are going to win the Super Bowl. So we play like we did today, we uh, King Kong and Ten Gorillas can't beat us. So we'll be all right against the Packers. The year was 1967. 
eight years after the formation of the American Football League. We hope that the years ahead will be the most memorable for our fans and our organization. The Oakland Raiders, with a roster comprised of some of the most feared and respected players to ever play the game, would embark on an incredible season that would set the tone for the young franchise for generations to come. Touchdown Raiders! In the 10-year history of the American Football League, the 1967 Raiders were the first and only team to post a 13-win season. Victory is just riding out the clock for Daryl LaMonica. With quarterback Daryl LaMonica at the helm, the Raiders' offense led the AFL in points scored and in that season finished third in total offense. But it was the defense that commanded the spotlight. The 11 angry men terrorized quarterbacks and recorded 67 sacks and 30 interceptions in 14 games. They also racked up six defensive touchdowns on the year, a year when they faced legendary quarterbacks such as Joe Namath and Len Dawson. The team's dominating play resulted in their first and only AFL championship. The afternoon belonged to the Raiders and their fans. The final was 40-7. The Raiders had become the unquestioned champions of the American Football League. Fifty years and three Super Bowls later, the landmark victory remains an example of what the silver and black stands for. Dominance, pride, and commitment to excellence. For the first time since they won the AFL championship on this very field 50 years ago, the team is back together again. We are pleased to have with us tonight, Tackle, Dan Archer. Running back, Pete Benazak. Running back, Estes Banks. Dwayne Benson, linebacker. Roger Bird, defensive back. Defensive back, Willie Brown. Linebacker Dan Connors. Running back Clem Daniels. Quarterback Cotton Davidson. Inside the kicker. Linebacker Bill Fairban. Linebacker Bill Lasky. Tight end Ken Harak. Guard Bob Cruz. Quarterback, Daryl LaMonica. Defensive back, Kent McClellan. Wide receiver, Bill Miller. Gus Otto, linebacker. 
the stunner double zero, Jim Otto. Defensive back Warren Flaw Powers. Tackle Bob Swios. In addition to the men who stand before us on the field tonight, we remember their teammates who are no longer with us but who are here in spirit. Please welcome in tonight's host, JT the Brick. Thank you, Gary. I'm absolutely honored to be here tonight with this group of men. Along with Al Davis, their hard work not only laid the foundation for the organization, but also defined what greatness means. As part of the AFL, which was often perceived as inferior to the NFL, this team helped change the mindset of everyone. who shaped the silver and black as we know it. Get up for him one last time. The 1967 American Football League champion Raiders. It's a privilege to have you men here tonight with us. Once a Raider, 
always a Raider. Oakland Raider Highlights, brought to you by the Oakland Bank of Commerce, serving the greater East Bay area for over 30 years. The Bank of Commerce provides complete banking facilities for both individuals and business organizations. Whatever your banking requirements, savings account, commercial account, loans of all types, trust services, you like the way you're treated at the Oakland Bank of Commerce. Why not let locally managed Oakland Bank of Commerce tackle all your financial problems? see in peace a place where once great gut battles raged. A season's past, but before forgot, think back those moments, glorious, when voices many thousand strong proclaimed the Western team victorious. That team, the Oakland Raiders, the defending AFL champions, had been the winningest team in the American Football League since 1963. In 1968, they became an undisputed powerhouse, gaining more yards and scoring more points than any other professional football team. And they did it with style. They could be gracefully spectacular. Or pugnaciously spectacular. they put the points on the board. Beat the best, and this film traces the week-by-week -week struggle of the longest, most exciting uphill battle in American Football League history. A winning preseason was sweetened by a victory over their frustrated West Bay rivals, the San Francisco 49ers. The regular season and the longest race began against the Bills in Buffalo. The defense that had earned fame in 67 as the 11 angry men did not all return, but those that did went right back to work. Tom Keating, the injured all-pro of Oakland's front four, was missing, but still there was Ike Lassiter, Big Ben Davidson, and the perennially underrated Dan Birdwell. Filling in competently for Keating was number 85, Carlton Oates. In the secondary was the great cornerback, Willie Brown. Dan Connors was still over the middle, but rookie Chip Oliver from USC was brought in to replace the injured linebacker, Bill Lasky. Despite the changes, the defense led by number 34, Gus Otto, held the builds and forced a punt early in the first quarter. Now there was another rookie and a new wrinkle in the Raiders' attack. George Atkinson, a 9-6 sprinter from Morris Brown College, opened the scoring flood that would embarrass even the strongest team. In 67, the Raiders' offense was criticized for lacking an outside pass receiver with exceptional speed. In their league debut of 68, they showed that criticism no longer fit. Quarterback Darrell LaMonica had a healthy Warren Wells at split end. 
That meant burning speed, good hands, and defenses would have to open up and respect the deep threat. Buffalo learned the hard way. The offensive line was sound with tackles number 76, Bob Sweas. Number 79, Harry Shue. Guards number 63, Gene Upshaw. Number 70, James Harvey. And Mr. AFL 00, Jim Otto, the nine-year All-Pro center. Fullback Hewitt Dixon was back supplying the power running, while a speed specialist named Larry Todd gave the Raiders that breakaway threat. From their premier performance, it looked like the defending AFL champions would breeze easily to an undefeated season. The fine play continued in their next game against the young Miami Dolphins. Versatile Pete Banaszak was outstanding. Behind number 65, Wayne Hawkins, key block. Banaszak scored one of his two touchdowns on the very field that he played his college ball for Miami. At the Astrodome, the Houston Oilers defense slowed down the high-scoring machine, but a defensive touchdown by Oakland's Dave Grayson turned the game into a 24-15 triumph. Grayson would make 10 interceptions in 68 and lead the league. Finally, homecoming, undefeated, a win today over the Boston Patriots would make the Raiders number one in the West. The show put on for the home fans was nothing short of magnificent. The silver and black were enchanted. Nothing could go wrong. Even fumbles paid off. Flanker Fred Belitnikoff, following this play, picked up the lost ball and scored. It was another big win for the Raiders. Their 14th in a row, and best of all, they were now number one in the West. but it was to be the last time that they would hold that number one spot alone. In the next two weeks, the Raiders would sink to third place. It was a rainy day in October when the San Diego Chargers visited Oakland. The Chargers had number 19, Lance Allworth, and he was good, too good. The Raiders were okay right up to halftime and only trailed 17-14. But the second half was all San Diego and Oakland lost 23-14. The myth that the Raiders were unbeatable ended and they were in a tie for second place with San Diego. In first place in their next opponent, the Kansas City Chiefs. In Kansas City, Missouri, the Oakland Raiders suffered their most humiliating defeat. The Chiefs receivers were all injured, so they relied purely on running. In fact, they set records for the most running and fewest passes in one game. But first, the Chiefs strangled the Raiders' offense. Then Kansas City mutilated Oakland's defense. Half the season gone, the Raiders dropped to third place behind Kansas City and San Diego. They had to win every game from now on or else. The demoralized Raiders returned home to face the upstart Bengals and their rookie sensation number 18, Paul Robinson. It looked like Oakland's days of glory were over. enough, and to a man the pride and poise that had made this team, the 1967 AFL champions returned. And from then on, the Bengals never had a chance. The overconfidence of a long winning streak was gone, and the Raiders were reborn and rededicated. The test of this new dedication came quickly. The first place Chiefs were in Oakland. But this time, the Chiefs' running game was hell. With his runners in check, Glenn Dawson was forced to go to the air, but under pressure. And so were his receivers. The 
the Raiders took over and quickly scored on a LaMonica hookup with Wells. But the Chiefs matched this, and it was an even game after one quarter. What followed can only be described as the Oakland Raider phenomenon. The devastating ability to score a cluster of points instantly. 24 points in the second quarter. Two Banazak plungers set up by long gains. One by Hewitt Dixon on a swing pass. The other by Fred Bolitnikoff. The 82-yard game by Bolitnikoff was the longest non-scoring play in Raider history. touchdown was a quarterback draw by La Monica. The Chiefs' spectacular offense could never compensate for the rash of Raider scoring. Oakland won but was still tied with San Diego for second place. But now the two were only a half game behind the Chiefs who still held the number one spot. But La Monica's knee was injured late in the game and he could not play the following week. His replacement was a 41-year-old veteran quarterback who played sparingly and is used as a kicking specialist. George Blander, 19-year veteran of football wars, had to beat the Denver Broncos to keep Oakland's title hopes alive. The old man murdered them. He threw four touchdown passes, won the longest scoring pass in Raider history, a 94-yard combination with Warren Wells. Not only did the Raiders win convincingly, they performed an important ritual in the Mile High City. A rookie running back was blooded. His first touchdown as a professional, a 64-yard burst went unheralded. But one week later in the most famous game played in 1968, the local boy from Oakland with the most unassuming name would become the most famous person never seen in the greatest game that never ended. It was the 11th week of the season, and the New York Jets under the command of Lord Fu Manchu Joe Namath were in the Oakland Coliseum. It was a battle between the two most explosive teams in professional football. Perfect execution like this tight end screen to Billy Cannon for a touchdown was the standard. pro cornerback Kent McLuhan placed rookie George Atkinson against professional football's leading receiver Don Maynard. Atkinson got an instant education. The lead changed back and forth six times before the score was finally tied at 29 all. Then the Jets' Jim Turner kicked a 26-yard field goal, and the Jets had the lead with one minute five seconds left. New York kicked off to rookie Charlie Smith, who couldn't make it out of bounds. A minute and one second left. While Charlie Smith gained 20 yards, the network televising the game made the classic blunder that seeded a new expression into the American language. NBC turned off the uncompleted game in favor of a kiddie special called Heidi. Only the sellout crowd of 53,000 the radio audience and West Coast television were aware of what followed in the now famous Heidi Bowl. New York was penalized 15 yards for face masking. Then that Oakland phenomenon began with only 50 seconds left. Millions of television viewers never saw the rookie from the University of Utah named Smith become a hero in his own hometown. Once again, that historic moment in the 9-6 speed that made it possible. And still 42 seconds left. Mike Eichheide kicked off. 
Earl Christie bobbled. Then his own man, number 30, ran into him, and he fumbled. Preston Reidelhuber pounced on the loose ball in the end zone, and the Oakland Coliseum became an enormous secret love-in called the Heidi Ball. Oakland scored 14 points in 8 seconds and won. But the Jets were virtually the Eastern Division champs, while the Raiders, even with this great victory, were still in a tie for second place in the West. The momentum of a Heidi Bowl carried into the following week against the Bengals. This time, no rookie sensation named Robinson would burn them with an 82-yard touchdown. It was the defense's greatest day. A complete shutout. The offense was phenomenal too, gaining over 600 yards, and the Raiders beat the coming Cincinnati. Even as the Raiders defeated the Bengals, something more important was happening this week. San Diego lost to the Jets. That meant that Kansas City and Oakland, with equal records, were tied for first place with only three games remaining. Since they did not play each other, it was possible to win every game and still be tied. If so, there would be the first Western Division playoff in history. On Thanksgiving Day, the Raiders, coming off a short week, were almost upset by the visiting Buffalo Bills, but for a great defensive effort by rookie George Atkinson. The Broncos were next. And like the week before, the Raiders barely won. The difference being a 65-yard repeat of Smith's first pro touchdown in Denver. Each week, Oakland seemed to be getting weaker, while Kansas City seemed to be getting stronger. The last game of the season was against the only team the Raiders had not beaten, the San Diego Chargers. Kansas City had played its final game the day before and won easily over the Broncos assuring them a first place finish. The pressure was all on the Raiders. It was a must win to force a playoff. By the half, both teams had scored but San Diego led 13-10. Then the defense broke open the game. Roger Bird fought a pass away from Jack McKinnon and the Raiders took the lead never to trail again. Even though they held the lead on spectacular plays like this 50-yard bomb to Wells, the Raiders, for the third straight week, just barely won. And worse, these very charges were the same club Kansas City had humiliated the week before, 40-3. This meant the Chiefs would be the favorites in the playoff. The Raiders, underdog. game plan was simple. Score quickly through the air and force the favorites to play catch-up football and abandon their strength, ball control. The plan worked perfectly the very first time Oakland got the ball. Now the defense had only to hold the Chiefs' wanted rushing attack and they would be home free. Done. Still the first quarter, and again Oakland went into the end zone for a 14 to nothing lead. The last play of the first quarter was a post pattern to Bolitnikov, and before the Chiefs knew what hit them, they trailed 21 to nothing. In the second quarter came the defense's finest moments of 1968. The Chiefs drove inside Oakland's five-yard line twice 
and were denied touchdowns both times. Instead, they were forced to take two field goals, less than 10 yards from the goal line. With only 28 seconds left in the first half, Fred Bolitnikoff took the game completely out of reach. What it was was just superior effort by one of football's most deceptive flankers. The moves made on all pro safety Johnny Robinson were phenomenal. But the rest, that was pure desire. You could read the final score on the faces of the players. Despite the nagging injuries, Despite the longest Western Division race, despite the experts' predictions of eventual failure, despite everything, the Oakland Raiders had the discipline, faith, and desire to triumph in the West. Now they would meet the Jets in New York as defending AFL champions in quest of their second straight championship. After the Heidi Bowl, there was no real favorite. It was a struggle between pro football's two finest teams. The only factor, a violent wind that gusted up to 30 miles per hour. Joe Namath challenged the win and put New York into an early lead. LaMonica closed the margin with a strike to Bolitnikoff. But Oakland trailed all the way to the fourth quarter. Don Maynard had been Namath's favorite target against the Raiders because the veteran faces rookie George Atkinson. This time, Atkinson burned Namath and Maynard. Only a rare tackle by Namath saved a score. But Pete Banaszak made the touchdown on the next play, and for the first time, Oakland had the lead with little time left in the game. It did not take long for Namath's arm to put the Jets into scoring range. Don Maynard, although not the primary receiver, on the next play found himself the open man, and New York regained the lead. But everyone knew from the Heidi Bowl that Oakland's scoring potential was terrifying. La Monica hit Wells for a 37-yard gain, and a piling-on penalty moved the ball to New York's 12 with only two minutes left. If there were just one play in the thousands that a team executes in one season, that could be replayed upon request, this swing pass would be that one for the Raiders. The loose football was a fumble that cannot be played, only recovered. The Jets took over and gave Oakland one more chance, but not enough time. The Oakland Raiders missed their date with destiny by four points, which is a lot fewer than the Baltimore Colts lost theirs by. The New York Jets made history by going to the Super Bowl and defeating the National Football League. It was a culmination of a dream for every American Football League team. And now the sports world knew what the Oakland Raiders had known for a long time. In 1963, it was pledged that the Raiders would become the finest organization in professional sports. Since then, the dynamic silver and black had become the winningest team in the AFL. But the true test of an organization is how long its success can endure. Past titles are only a plateau. The ultimate goal, a world championship under the new head coach, John Madden. Yet 1968 will live in the memory of Raider fans, for it was a season of uphill struggle to defend the title in the West than to be set back in the East. But for the Oakland Raiders, four points could not blot out a year of glory. Nor could any event erase years of pride, poise and progress with a single day of defeat.
In Boston, it took John Madden's Oakland Raiders, especially quarterback Daryl LaMonica, a while to get warmed up. Meanwhile, Patriot quarterback Mike Tolliver was making a silver and black shambles of the Raiders. First, he hit number 81, Charlie Frazier, for a quick touchdown. Next, he pirouetted 360 degrees and threw deep to number 34, top draft choice Ron Sellers of Florida State Fame. Then Tolliver faked to Jim Nance and fired his second touchdown to number 82, tight end Jim Whalen. Boston 13, Oakland nothing. But a funny thing happened on the way to the 14th point. From then on, Mike Tolliver and the Patriots might as well have gone home. Number 77 is defensive end Ike Lassiter. And number three is quarterback Daryl LaMonica, who finally had warmed up. His first touchdown pass went to number 81, Warren Wells. His second was to number 25, Fred Bolitnikov. LaMonica's third touchdown was a classic bomb. Again to Warren Wells, wide open for an easy 55-yard score. LaMonica's fourth touchdown pass was a screen to fullback Hewitt Dixon, number 35. Dixon trampled everything in front of him on his way to the crushing score as Darrell LaMonica and the undefeated Raiders bombed winless Boston, 38-23. On April 21st, 2022, the football world lost a legend when Daryl LaMonica, best known as the quarterback for the Oakland Raiders, passed away at the age of 80. And to say that LaMonica left a lasting legacy on the game and on this sport would be a massive understatement. To list all of LaMonica's accomplishments and accolades would require me to make this video over an hour long. He made it to five AFL All-Star Games and Pro Bowls over his career, where he spent four seasons with the Buffalo Bills and eight with the Oakland Raiders. He truly earned the nickname the Mad Bomber because of how good his deep ball was. And perhaps most notably, he guided the Oakland Raiders to their first Super Bowl appearance in franchise history, as he was the starting quarterback when they made it to Super Bowl II before falling at the hands of the Green Bay Packers. There are plenty of legendary stories and moments from the legendary career of Daryl LaMonica. But here's one that you might not know about that truly exemplifies just how good he was and how much of an inspiration he was to millions of football fans across the country. We've talked at length on this channel about incredibly gutsy performances, where a player seemingly comes out of nowhere to play despite a brutal injury, only to light it up and guide his team to victory. You can learn more about those games by clicking the card in the upper right corner. From Houston Oilers quarterback Dan Pastorini in the 1978 wildcard game against the Miami Dolphins, to Dolphins quarterback Bob Greasy in a 1971 game against the Pittsburgh Steelers, where he went from the hospital to the field on the same day, there are some great games that live on in the history of the NFL. And this story from Daryl LaMonica deserves to be remembered, although technically, it was in the AFL. In a 1969 game against the Cincinnati Bengals, LaMonica did the impossible, and put in a performance for the ages under the most improbable of circumstances. And this is the story behind one of the greatest moments in the Mad Bomber's career. Before we talk about the game and the performance in question, we need some context to understand just who Daryl LaMonica is, and how he was playing entering this game. Obviously, by this point in the 1960s, LaMonica was one of the most feared quarterbacks in the American Football League, and it's not too hard to see why. In 1967, which was his first season with the Raiders, he was named an All-Star and a first-team All-Pro while going 13-1, while leading the AFL with 30 passing touchdowns, 
and while being named the AFL Player of the Year by the Associated Press, becoming the first and only player in franchise history to ever receive that honor. And he followed that up in 1968 with another great season, where he went 11-2 while throwing for 25 touchdowns and 3,473 yards, both of which ranked second in the league behind John Hadle of the San Diego Chargers. As a side note, to learn more about the legendary career of John Hadle, another AFL legend who doesn't get the respect he deserves today, click the card in the upper right corner. When you're one of the best quarterbacks statistically in the league over the past two seasons, and when you've gone 24-3 as a starter in that stretch, winning an insane 89% of your games, people are going to have high expectations for you the following season. But what might be crazy is that the 1969 season was looking like Lamonica's best. Better than the previous year, where he almost led the league in yards and touchdowns. Better than the year before that, where he was named the AP Player of the Year. He was that good in 1969 that this might have been the best year of them all. Through the first 12 weeks of the season, LaMonica kept up his winning ways, as he was 10-1-1. He threw a touchdown pass at every single game, and had 30 touchdowns through his first 12 games of the year. Keep in mind that the all-time record in pro football, held by Y.A. Tittle of the New York Giants in 1963, and George Blanda of the Houston Oilers in 1961, was 36 touchdowns. So LaMonica had an actual realistic shot of tying or potentially breaking the record with two games to go. And he was coming off of a great game against the New York Jets, who were the defending Super Bowl champions. As the Raiders went on the road to Shea Stadium in a rematch of the 1968 AFL Championship, LaMonica proved himself by completing over 67% of his passes for 333 yards and two touchdowns, while posting a pass rating of 117.1 in a 27-14 victory. He also tacked on a rushing touchdown just for good measure. LaMonica was incredibly good, and I think that goes without saying. Many people were even going as far as to call him the best quarterback in the AFL. And again, it's not too hard to see why, considering the success he had from both an individual and a team perspective. But that lone blemish on the schedule? The lone game that resulted in the Raiders losing? And the lone game that truly stunned the football world? Well, that came in Week 8 when the Raiders lost 31-17 to the Cincinnati Bengals. And to be honest, the game wasn't even that close, as the Bengals led a 31-3 midway through the fourth quarter before two garbage-time touchdown passes by LaMonica. The touchdowns and the garbage-time numbers make LaMonica's performance look somewhat more respectable on the box score, but nothing's taking away from the poor completion percentage of 47.8%, and nothing is taking away from the five interceptions he threw that day which was the most he had ever thrown in a game in his career, and would remain forever as the most interceptions that he ever threw in a single game. Fortunately, because the Raiders and Bengals were in the same division, which was the AFL West, LaMonica would get his chance at revenge, because on the second to last week of the season, and on December 7th, the Raiders would get to host the Bengals in the penultimate match of the year. And aside from the obvious revenge factor, this was a really big game for the Raiders. Yes, they entered the game at 10-1-1, and yes, they had clinched a playoff spot by this point, so the Raiders were going to be playing playoff football for the third straight year, to the surprise of literally no one. However, they wanted home field advantage, and wanted the easier playoff matchup, and the Kansas City Chiefs were right on their tail for the division lead at 10-2. The Chiefs were only half a game behind, so the Raiders had no room for error over the final two weeks of the season especially against a struggling Bengals team that hadn't won a game since that upset over the Raiders. If the Raiders were going to win this one, and keep their hold on the AFL West heading into the final week of the 1969 season, and the final regular season week ever in AFL history before the merger happened, then they were going to need a strong performance out of Daryl LaMonica. They needed the man under center to do something. The five interceptions he had against the Bengals over a month ago the last time the teams met was simply not going to cut it. The good news for the Raiders entering this game was that it was looking incredibly unlikely that LaMonica would repeat that performance. The bad news, however, was that it was looking incredibly unlikely that LaMonica would even get the chance to repeat it, because he was not going to play in this game. At some point during the Raiders-Jets game the week before, LaMonica took a shot from a Jets defender. We have no idea what the play was, as there were no reports about the specific play nor is there any video evidence of said play happening. However, LaMonica got injured so badly on the play that he injured his back. His back was feeling incredibly stiff, and that's not a good feeling for any person to have, as generally speaking, we don't want to be in back pain, 
and we do not function well as humans when we are in back pain. But for a quarterback, especially one who needs to move around and who is going to take shot after shot from opposing defenders, that's really not good. Things got so bad that according to one report, head coach John Madden reserved a room in a local hospital for LaMonica to check into, although this report was denied. Still, the fact that the rumor was floating around shows you just how much pain he was in. And on Saturday, that rumor became way more than a rumor. Because on Saturday, December 6th, literally the night before the game, LaMonica checked into the hospital. Even though his back got stiff in that game against the Jets, he was trying to find a way to work through the pain, and he was practicing. Heck, LaMonica was known for playing through pain, and he wasn't going to let anything stop him from stepping onto the football field if he could do something about it. Earlier in the season, he went to the hospital for flu treatment the night before a game against the San Diego Chargers, and wound up winning the game 24-12 while throwing for three touchdown passes. It's not like LaMonica hadn't played through pain before, as even though he was still feeling the after effects of the Jets game, he was going to try his best to fight through it, and to start another game at quarterback, which would have been his 13th of the season out of 13 possible games played at the time. But something happened during practice, because when he was throwing that day, his back was extremely knotted up. And at that moment, LaMonica went to the hospital. From there, the pain was incredibly brutal, as he was in no physical condition or shape to even move from his hospital bed to the bathroom, let alone play in a game. As LaMonica later said, it was doubtful I could even dress for the Cincinnati game, let alone start. They put me in the hospital, gave me muscle relaxers, but I didn't sleep at night. Sunday morning, December 7th, I couldn't even get out of bed. That's right. LaMonica's back was so bad that he couldn't even get out of bed, and did not have the strength to do so. When your starting quarterback is saying that, and is in that much pain, it means one thing if you're a head coach you better prepare for someone else to start. Yet, this is what LaMonica was known for. He was known for a lot of great things, but part of why football fans across the country loved the man was because he played through the pain. He toughed it out. He even considered it a badge of honor of sorts to be playing and fighting through that many injuries, and not only play, but play at the highest level that the AFL brings to the table. As LaMonica would say on this whole process, and how he dealt with the rash of injuries he had around this game, just fighting injuries, I didn't think I had a shot at it. It's kind of a total shock. It's one of the highest honors you can get. A tremendous honor. This is all a fancy way of saying that LaMonica was going to find a way, sore back and all, to not only get out of bed, but then play in a game against a defense that completely shut him down a month ago, and play well. LaMonica met with one doctor that Sunday morning, who brought him over a light punching bag. LaMonica began to punch the bag, and after punching this bag for half an hour, the doctor was ready to clear him, as the doctor said that he couldn't do any more damage. And when you give LaMonica the call to play in the game or ride the bench, he's going to take that first option every day of the week, and in this case, twice on Sunday. While all this was happening on that fateful Sunday morning, a nurse came into LaMonica's room and told him, you may not even get out of here today. But LaMonica, pain and all, did not want to be confined to the room of a hospital. He wanted to be confined to the football field. And LaMonica, carrying a grimace with his bad back and all, said to the nurse, My first touchdown pass will be for you. And with that, LaMonica, after spending Saturday night in the hospital and being in excruciating pain to start off Sunday morning in the hospital, with one nurse flat out telling him that he might not be able to leave the hospital until later in the week, he left the hospital and went down to the Oakland Coliseum. The fact that LaMonica was even going to play in this game after starting that day in a hospital bed of all places was remarkable. But the craziest part about this performance? The Mad Bomber was truly a madman, because on this mild December day, not only did the Raiders get their revenge and win it 37-17, returning the favor by crushing the Bengals, but Daryl LaMonica had yet another incredible game to remember, especially in the first half. Oakland had the lead from the very beginning of the game and never looked back. In the first quarter, LaMonica hit Warren Wells for a 51-yard touchdown to make it 7-0 Raiders. And at no point did the teams ever tie, or did the Raiders relinquish that lead, because from that point on, it was all Oakland, and especially all Darrell LaMonica. He connected with Wells early in the second quarter on a 16-yard touchdown, which made the game 14-0. And before the end of the first half, 
LaMonica did it again and hit Fred Belitnikoff on a 16-yard touchdown to make a 21-7, giving the Raiders a two-possession lead. This game was a dominant performance all the way around. The Raiders had 26 first downs compared to just 10 for the Bengals, meaning that the Raiders had more than two and a half times their total. The Raiders had 309 rushing yards compared to 102 for the Bengals. The Raiders had more than double the passing yards at 235 to 108, and 544 yards of total offense compared to 210 for the Bengals. And whereas Cincinnati's passing game struggled and couldn't get anything going, with Greg Cook going 5 for 15 while completing 33% of his passes with no touchdowns, one interception, and a pass rating of 35.1, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball to the ground on every single play, Oakland's passing game was the exact opposite. Because LaMonica, bad back and all, really came to play on this day. By the time the game finished, LaMonica had three passing touchdowns, which was three off of the all-time pro football record, and definitely made this an achievable and attainable goal heading into the last week of the season. LaMonica's three touchdowns, all in the first half, marked the sixth time all season, and the first time since week nine a month ago that he threw three touchdowns in a game. He somehow found the strength to go deep, as he averaged over nine yards per passing attempt, which was over a full yard per attempt above his season average. And he was doing this while in extreme pain, and while receiving heat pad treatment during the game just to try and make the pain go away. As LaMonica said on the aforementioned injury that caused it, we were just having a slight drill. I went back to throw and got this bad pain. I couldn't believe it. I must not be living right or something. But despite all that pain, he delivered and then some, and put on a great performance while guiding his Raiders to a victory, just as he had done many times before. Darrell LaMonica had an absolutely incredible NFL career, and I think that goes without saying. But of all the 151 games that LaMonica played in the regular season, and of all the 13 playoff games that LaMonica played in, Perhaps no game exemplifies what kind of a player Daryl LaMonica was more than the 1969 game against the Cincinnati Bengals. On Sunday morning, he was in a hospital bed in awful back pain, unable to even get up at first. On Sunday afternoon, he threw three touchdown passes and made the average fan watching completely unaware that he was playing hurt, because he couldn't tell. What Daryl LaMonica did on this day and in his career was nothing short of remarkable because on this December day in 1969, when it came to his insane decision to play in the game, the Mad Bomber truly looked like a mad man. Get your As an Oakland football coach, John Madden has every reason to expect a few winter showers. Instead, he got a three-day torrential rainstorm prior to the Houston playoff game, and the ground crews were forced to come up with some novel methods of puddle removal. A worried Daryl LaMonica even helped to prepare the field as he pondered on a way to move his team through the slop. It took him just two minutes to come up with an appropriate answer. A ground camera replay shows that LaMonica had successfully negotiated a quarterback's dream and isolated a swift setback Larry Todd on Houston linebacker Olin Underwood, number 56. Todd's catch and slide proved to be a fitting send-off for the landslide which was to follow. And then Fred Bolitnikoff showed that sometimes one hand is as good as two. If LaMonica could throw in the mud, Houston's Pete Bethard naturally assumed that a similar course of action would be effective for the Oilers. Number 43, George Atkinson, proved him wrong.
When the Oakland Raiders start out a game in this fashion, the points usually materialize in quick clusters of seven. Predictably, Houston fumbled on the first play after the kickoff, and a substitute wide receiver showed that while he was not another Warren Wells, he certainly was a fine Rod Sherman. No one was too surprised when four plays later, Oakland again had the ball courtesy of another Houston fumble. Again, results were as predictable as the results of next year's Russian election. In a ground camera replay, we can observe Bolitnikov's excellent body control. He has his man beaten to the outside and then maneuvers back to the inside to take the off-target throw. Bolitnikov had his second touchdown reception of the game and the Raiders had scored 28 points in a four-minute span. Trailing 28-0 with still five minutes remaining in the first quarter, Bethard was forced to go for broke against a Raiders secondary, which could now afford to lay back and play the field. LaMonica was not through yet as he again swung one of his running backs out of the backfield to bedevil the Houston linebackers. This time it was Charlie Smith and the second-year man from Utah made the play look simple. Before retiring for the day, number three threw for two more touchdowns, including another to Rod Sherman, who filled in brilliantly for the injured Warren Wells. When LaMonica finally sat down, he did so with impressive credentials. 14 completions out of 17 attempts, 276 yards, and six touchdowns. The demon which had cursed the shell-shocked Oilers stayed with him throughout the long afternoon and kept success inches away. Houston was not able to score until they were 49 points behind. And number 89 Alvin Reed threw the ball down in disgust instead of joy. When Marv Hubbard, number 39, traveled four yards for the eighth Raider touchdown of the game, his excitement was that of a rookie scoring his first pro points. However, his older teammates had already begun to calmly plan another Oakland ambush for the Kansas City Chiefs. On December 20th, the Western Division champion Oakland Raiders prepared to meet the Houston Oilers in the American Conference playoff. On this day, outstanding young coach John Madden must have pondered the preceding 14 weeks. He well remembered the experts' predictions that 1969 would be the biggest challenge the Raiders ever faced. He remembered the injuries and the weeks of strain and struggle that began against the same Houston Oilers. Opening day was a beautiful combination of sunshine and spirit. The Oilers were not impressed with the Raiders. They unveiled their jack-in-the-box rookie receiver Jerry Levias, number 23, and Houston scored 10 points. But the Raiders had a master jack in safety Dave Grayson, number 45, and his interception created the first scoring opportunity of the game early in the first quarter. Behind number 70, guard Jim Harvey's key block, Charlie Smith swept for the TD. Moments later, Grayson again intercepted, and the silver and black once more threatened to score. It was no idle threat, as Gene Upshaw, number 63, led Charlie Smith into the end zone. The 14-10 advantage held until late in the game, when Houston skidded into a 17-14 lead. The Raiders needed a big play, a game-breaker, and they got it from number 81, Warren Wells. It was a good, close game, one that portended things to come. The Miami Dolphins fell victim to the same thief who robbed the Oilers, 
Dave Grayson's interception went 76 yards. The nine-year veteran from Oregon would eventually lead the team in interceptions with a total of eight. But the underrated Dolphins came right back and scored on the individual brilliance of running back Jim Kick. With only 15 seconds left in the game, veteran George Blanda provided another big play on a 46-yard field goal, and the Raiders won again. To 33-year-old John Madden, the first two games of the season left no doubt concerning the task facing the Raiders. Against the Boston Patriots and their Rookie of the Year, Carl Garrett, the Raiders would again face an uphill struggle. It was in this game, under Madden's leadership, that the Raiders' pride and poise began to assert itself. A one-handed interception by linebacker Gus Otto. A crushing charge by defensive Ann Ike Lassiter. The meticulously designed Oakland offense then began its precision bombing of Boston's defense. From any place on the field, any play can be six points. It's more than just a bomb, it's control. It's Hewitt Dixon leaving a string of stunned defenders in his wake. Playing football for the Oakland Raiders means dedication, sacrifice, and struggle. It's yardage and touchdowns, not completion percentage. Facing the Dolphins for the second time in three weeks, the Raiders found themselves again needing a big play. In fact, two. They got one from linebacker Bill Lasky. And another on Daryl LaMonica's pass to Fred Belitnikoff. Still, the end result was a frustrating 2020 tie. Part of the challenge facing the Raiders was the overall strength of the dominant American conference. In Denver, the Raiders faced the tough, improved Broncos. But all the King's horses couldn't stop Art Tom's number 80 from blocking a punt. And in a bitter struggle, Oakland drove to a 24-14 victory. Last of the early season Eastern rivals were the Buffalo Bills with highly touted O.J. Simpson. Any hopes Buffalo might have had for an upset were strictly out of bounds. Daryl LaMonica and tight end Billy Cannon combined for an early Oakland lead. LaMonica went on to devastate Buffalo with six touchdown passes in the first half, and the Raiders remained undefeated during the first five weeks. In San Diego, however, the Chargers were more than anxious to see that the Raiders' string ended at five. John Hadle and number 19, Lance Allworth, excelled early. The Chargers benefited from 180 yards in penalties against Oakland. But loyal fans who made the trip down from Oakland were but momentarily disappointed. It was a brutal game, with both quarterbacks suffering through rough treatment. Early in the first quarter, LaMonica was knocked unconscious. The Chargers had a field goal, and Oakland was scoreless. The 28-year-old quarterback insisted on staying in. This was his very next play. A perfect strike to Larry Todd. From then on, Oakland completely dominated. Pete Banaszak gained more than 120 yards. LaMonica's pass to the late and talented Roger Hagberg made it 24-12. The memory of Roger Hagberg will always be cherished. Oakland had won a record 15 consecutive games. One more was not to be. 
for lurking in the shadows were the Cincinnati Bengals, led by their bright young quarterback, Greg Cook. The 31-17 defeat marked the halfway point in the season, and Oakland was suddenly in second place behind Kansas City. It was a grim setting the following week, with Oakland's great record in the 1969 season in jeopardy. The Raiders managed to settle down from the upset at the hands of the Bengals and defeated the Denver Broncos 41-10. Linebacker Chip Oliver opened the Oakland scoring. Daryl LaMonica completed three touchdown passes to Fred Bolitnikoff, whose sure hand sealed the Broncos' fate. The Chargers then came to Oakland with a new coach. The Raiders were no kinder to the new one than they were to the old. Linebacker Dan Connors tore the ball loose and scored a stunning touchdown. When San Diego pulled ahead late in the game, LaMonica and Warren Wells again provided the big play in the 21-16 victory, and Oakland had taken a big step toward regaining first place. The San Diego series had been a real foot race, but the Raiders were victorious and turned toward the first of four crucial games. The Kansas City Chiefs, brooding, intense, still stinging from last year's humiliation, were the first hurdle, and were favored in this game at home. They took the lead on a McVay sweep. But Oakland's defense contributed five interceptions. Won by aggressive George Atkinson, went for a touchdown. A bullet to Wells tied the score. In the second half, Dan Connor scored his fifth career touchdown by galloping 75 yards for the winning six points. Tackles Harry Shue and Bob Spears were the first to congratulate Connors. But the 27-24 outcome revealed the closeness of these two great teams. The Raiders left a soggy field in Kansas City to find a cold one in New York. Tina and Mary may love Joe Namath, but they were not the only people at Chase Stadium with at least a crush on him. Mike Lassiter, Ben Davidson, Carlton Oates, and Tom Keating knew that to win, they had to get to Namath. While Mr. Namath received visitors all day, Mr. Bolitnikoff simply received. It was the same kind of game the Raiders played against the Jets in preseason and won. Charlie Smith and the ground attack were potent. But Oakland's ace remained the quick strike. La Monica to Wells.
the special teams, men like Bill Budness, Wayne Hopkins, Al Dotson, Art Shell, Dwayne Benson, Howie Williams, Drew Bowie, George Beeler, and Jackie Allen all got a shot at the world champions. Number 36, Lloyd Edwards, once stole the ball to set up for Raider touchdown. For Daryl the Monica and the rest of the Oakland Raiders, it was a day of supreme satisfaction as they defeated the Jets 27 to 14, avenging last year's championship game. Beating the world champions was a memorable experience, but coach John Madden also remembered his only loss. 40 Oakland Raiders remembered as well. The 37-17 victory over the Bengals was a prelude to the final showdown with the Chiefs. A showdown for supremacy in the Western Conference and home field advantage in the playoffs. In Oakland for the final game, All-Pro Willie Brown received the Gorman Award as the Raiders' most inspirational player. The Chiefs too had inspiration. They surely got it from the only coach they have ever had. Hank Stram. John Madden, in only his first year, was put to his greatest task. It was a rugged defensive struggle. The end around, which became so prominent in the Super Bowl, was easily deciphered by Tom Keating. When stopped themselves, Raider kicking specialist Mike Eyshide boomed 70 yards. The special teams prevented any return. The Raider offense was often brilliant, but could only build a 3-0 advantage going into the fourth quarter. At that point, LaMonica drove his club to the Chiefs' eight-yard line. Charlie Smith went in for the score. The Chiefs were far from finished, however, as they drove the length of the field and on fourth down, scored. Five and a half minutes left. The Raiders had to play ball control. Third and five, LaMonica to Cannon for 12. But passing was risky. Enter Marv Hubbard, number 39, rookie fullback. 18 precious time-consuming yards. Hubbard again. And with time running out, Oakland was beating Kansas City at its own game. Ball control. The Raiders were Western Division champions for the third straight year. To coach of the year, John Madden and his outstanding coaching staff, Ollie Spencer, Tom Doms, John Polanchek, Richie McCabe, Sid Hall, Dick Wood, Marv Marinovich, a job well done. The Raiders were now poised under cloudy skies to play the Oilers again. This time for the right to play in the AFL championship game. Monica to Bolitnikov, make it 7 nothing early. One play later and George Atkinson intercepts on his own 43.
On the sidelines, Warren Wells is injured. He will be replaced by young Rod Sherman, number 13. The front five make it possible. 79, Shu. 76, Vias. 00, Jim Otto, 10 years an All-Pro. Number 70, Harvey. 63, Upshaw. And a grateful Billy Cannon. The Raiders led 21-0 still in the first quarter. But wary of a letdown, 40 determined Raiders keep the pressure on. Marv Hubbard scores his first professional touchdown, and the Raiders have overcome every obstacle. All that remains the Super Bowl and the World Championship. But first, they must beat the Chiefs for the third straight time. The end of a decade of dedication the final AFL championship. In the first half, the Chiefs tried to throw over the Raider defense and run over it. Neither worked. Oakland got in scoring position on a quick strike to Wells. Behind picture blocking by Billy Cannon and Jim Harvey, Charlie Smith swept in for the score. But the Chiefs tied it just before halftime. In the third quarter, when the Chiefs were unable to move the ball in conventional ways, they began to move it in unconventional ways. From his own two-yard line, Len Dawson threw to Otis Taylor, number 89. The controversial play netted 35 yards. Another key play, a controversial interference call against Namaya Wilson. The Chiefs consummated their good fortune into a touchdown and took the lead they never lost. Kansas City's front four found the heart of the Raiders' scoring machine and damaged the chief engineer. The explosive powerhouse offense that had struck the 49ers in preseason that had beaten every team at least once, that had beaten the Chiefs seven out of the last eight times, was quiet. The Kansas City Chiefs made history for the American Football League by once again beating the National Football League in the Super Bowl. So after 10 years of dedication, a day of defeat curtailed the destiny of the Oakland Raiders but nothing could blot out the years of glory. In 1963, then general manager, head coach Al Davis, made the commitment to excellence for the silver and black, 
Since then, the Raiders have become the winningest team in the American Football League with the three best back-to-back -back seasons in the history of pro football. No team had ever won 12 games or more, three years in a row, not even twice in a row. The Raiders also led the AFL in total offense and scoring for the third straight year. 1970 begins a new decade. The years ahead will be the most exciting chapters in their history. The new realignment and the new schedule make the challenge for the Oakland Raiders the greatest it has ever faced. For the true test of a great organization is how long its success can endure. For those of us who love the Raiders in this great community, this indeed will be a decade of destiny. For now the challenge will not only be the American Conference, but the National Conference as well. Well, here they are, from New York City, Joe Namath. And from Oakland, California, Daryl LaMonica. Both these quarterbacks performed as champions in perhaps the finest and roughest game of the year. LaMonica's strategy was basic. Control the ball with deliberate short passes to his backs and ends. Billy Cannon demonstrated this theory perfectly early in the game. Joe Namath wanted to run his club in the early going, but found all avenues blocked. So he had to do what he does best. Throw the long bomb. This one was incomplete, but it foretold of things to come. With seconds remaining in the first half, Namath threw to George Sauer, but pass interference was ruled, one of 19 penalties called today. After the penalty break, Namath fooled everyone by running himself for the touchdown. The halftime score was New York 12, Oakland 14. The Raiders lost the ball and now the Jets could take the lead. Rookie defensive back George Atkinson was having his troubles with the Jets' fine receivers. And Namath knew it. So he and Don Maynard picked on him until they scored the go-ahead touchdown in the fourth quarter. Oakland was now behind, and they just could not afford to be behind this late in the game or this late in the season. Fred Bolitnikoff led a march that culminated in a game-tying touchdown. Through four quarters, the teams had battled. And now it was all even, 29 to 29. With less than four minutes remaining, it was a whole new ball game. 
but Namath and Maynard still worked on Atkinson, but more importantly, they were working on the clock. The Jets used up three minutes of time before Jim Turner set up for a field goal. The Jets led again, 32 to 29, with one minute and five seconds remaining. What transpired from here was unfortunately not shown to the nation's television audience. After returning the kickoff 22 yards, Charlie Smith, number 23, sped 20 yards closer. A costly face mask penalty moved the ball to New York's 43-yard line. Oakland's next play was to be their biggest of the year. With 42 seconds left, Charlie Smith put Oakland ahead, and in a replay we can see how he did it. Mike D'Amato was forced to cover Smith, and it was no match. Oakland's own Charlie Smith had given the Raiders a four-point lead, and now the Jets had a chance to come back. <laughs> Veteran Earl Christie lost the ball, and Preston Reidelhuber, number 37, recovered in the end zone for another Raider touchdown. Preston expressed the joy of all Oakland fans. In an astounding game, it was finally New York 32, Oakland 43. Monica to Charlie Smith. Smith is hitting and he scores. What a game! This crowd has gone absolutely berserk. Twice the Raiders have looked beaten, and rookie Charlie Smith, who's put on quite a show, has just grabbed this one. And now Oakland has the lead 35 to 32 with 42 seconds. But the Jets still have Namath coming back. That makes it 36 to 32. But now the Jets receive. The last two times the Jets have had the ball, they've marched right down for scores on Namus passing. Namus 17 for 35 today, 342 yards. LaMonica is uh, 20 for 32 and 251 yards. They squibbed this one to prevent a run back. Earl Christie fumbling it around. 
He fumbles the ball. And Oakland has it for a touchdown. Oakland has scored two touchdowns in nine seconds. Oakland now is kicking off after the penalty on the extra point. They're kicking off from the New York Jet 45. It just might be that I should will kick this ball over the goal line. He might boot it into the seat. And he does. It bounces out again. The Jets will never lose a more heartbreaking game than this. They had this one right in their hands with a minute five to go. They kept coming back and coming back. They scored with three seconds to go at the end of the half. They were behind, took the lead. Oakland went ahead. The Jets came back again to take the lead. Dave Perilli's the quarterback now. Boozer fumbles the ball. Ben Davidson has him, and Davidson bulldogs him down. Ben Davidson, number 83. This one's about all over, 15 seconds. We'll have a quick sign-off here. We hope you enjoyed the game. We'll be in San Diego next Sunday, 4 o'clock Eastern time, with a Jets against San Diego. This is Kurt Gowdy, and a great job today by L.D. Rogatis. And that's it, the final score, Oakland 43, New York 32. From the Oakland Coliseum, the House of Horrors, NBC aired one of the AFL's great rivalries. Daryl LaMonica's Raiders hosting Joe Namath's New York Jets. The game evolved into an epic seesaw battle best told by the legendary voice of John Facenda. The lead changed back and forth six times before the score was finally tied at 29 all. Then the Jets' Jim Turner kicked a 26-yard field goal, and the Jets had the lead with one minute, five seconds left. At 7 p.m., NBC had scheduled a kids' movie named Heidi. It was determined to air Heidi at 7 o'clock, and if football wasn't over, we would still go to Heidi at 7 o'clock. NBC executives wishing to stay with the game failed in their frantic efforts to contact the broadcast center. Thousands of concerned viewers had flooded the phone lines and blown out the switchboard. I thought, well, I have not been given any countermanding order, so I've got to do what we agreed to do. While Charlie Smith gained 20 yards, the network televising the game made the classic blunder. NBC turned off the uncompleted game in favor of a kiddie special called Heidi. The guy pushes the button at 7 o'clock and away they went. And here's the game going right down the crapper. And I breathed a big sigh of relief. I'm sure I was the only person in the country who did. While NBC viewers, except those on the West Coast, were subjected to Heidi frolicking among mountain goats. The Raiders made goats of NBC. Monica to Charlie Smith, and he scores! What a game! On the subsequent kickoff, Jets' teammates collided. The Raiders recovered the fumble for their second touchdown in nine seconds and went on to win by 11 points. And the Oakland Coliseum became an enormous secret love-in called the Heidi Bowl. We knew that we won the game. The people in the stadium knew we won the game. But the people who were watching on television across the country thought that the Jets won and we lost. So we ran a, a flash test in a little crawl uh, informing everybody of the final score. It was where the uh, little girl cousin who has been crippled is trying desperately to walk for the first time. I jumped up and screamed. Oh, God! The screams in New York lingered long after the game ended. I landed at the airport. My father said, what's wrong? He said, you should be happy because you guys beat the Raiders. I said, Dad, what are you talking about? He said, when they interrupted the game, you guys were up by seven, eight points or whatever it was. I said, yeah, but we lost the game by 11. Oh, that girl is interrupting my life again. I do recall about a week after the show went on the air that NBC took out a full page ad with great quotes from the critics about Heidi. The very last quote was, well, I didn't 
get to see the show, but I hear it was real good. Signed, Joe Namath. The 68 Jets Raiders game was voted the greatest regular season contest of all time. Not because of Don Maynard's 228 receiving yards, still a Jets record, or even the Raiders' nine-second scoring explosion. But for a little girl who stole the show. That was the greatest promotion that the AFL ever had was the Heidi game. I don't know, 10 years earlier, if you did the same thing on a, on a telecast, would you get that kind of an uproar? I don't know, but you sure did at that point in time, and it sure lets you know that you better not take my football away from me at 7 o'clock. This is NFL Action, and I'm Pat Summerall. Until 1968, winning the AFL championship was like climbing a hill, only to stand in the shadow of a mountain. But this year, climbing the hill was harder than climbing the mountain. For the AFL championship, in retrospect, became the most important game of the year, as it would, in the end, produce pro football's world champion. Absolutely. It's quick. Four years. It took a long time coming. Four years. You want to win every year. First year on. Winning. Nothing else matters to me. Winning. Whether I catch one or ten. Nothing else matters. At the time, I thought it was just a fumble, so I reached down, picked it up, and took off. We were just happy to get the ball. Has there been a key this year? There are about 50 strong hearts out here. That's where the key was. Jet Woolley had says, call up there today. Jet Woolley. For the thousands who came, for the millions who viewed, the AFO championship seemed to offer a predictable struggle. The league's two best quarterbacks would match passes, while their respective coaches would match strategies. The game would be predictable in some ways, bizarre in others. But as the tension grew for the opening kickoff, one thing was clear. If the AFO championship was to be a mere prelude to Miami's Super Bowl, it would indeed be a stunning prelude. prolific offense in pro football. He would have liked to have scored early, but the Oakland Raiders found it impossible to do anything in their first offensive series as New York's defense dealt them a telling psychological blow in round one. Like a school of sharks, the Jets' offense struck swiftly, as swiftly as Oakland had been stopped. Joe Namath to Don Maynard for a first down. Matt Snell over left tackle for six. Namath to Maynard again, 14 yards and a touchdown. On the play, Maynard had been aided by his own muddy field. Defender George Atkinson slipped as Maynard made his cut, and the Jets' flanker made the catch unmolested. It was quick and it was easy, but it would be their only touchdown for nearly three quarters of the game. Oakland's second series was as fruitless and as frustrating as its first. Drop passes would not be uncommon. Freezing temperatures and 50 mile per hour gusts made it difficult for either team's receivers to hold the ball. Yet fate somehow dealt the Raiders more than their fair share. A pass that tipped off the hands of Fred Bolitnikoff was one in a series of near misses that would haunt Oakland long after the final gun. 
This attempted field goal that followed was yet another. The rest of the first quarter was a struggle for both teams, characterized by grudging defensive play and the inaccurate passing of both quarterbacks. The teams exchanged the ball eight times and could collectively muster only two first downs. Through all the wind-blown passes and flying bodies, it was evident that the Raiders were flat. They were playing as dead as this punt that rolled to a halt deep in New York territory. From here, late in the quarter, Joe Namath went to his ground game in hopes of adding another touchdown to his 7-0 lead. But after Boozer and Snell took him to the Raiders 25, Namath's arm betrayed him. The Jets would have to settle for a field goal from Jim Turner and a 10-0 first quarter lead. Through the first quarter, viewers had not yet seen what they had expected. A battle of the league's best receivers. Their complex formations and patterns. There was Don Maynard, number 13, who had scored the game's only touchdown and had been wide open on other occasions in the first period. But in the second quarter, Atkinson would play him tight and tough and would hold Maynard to one insignificant catch. Then there was the Raiders' great receiver, number 25, Fred Boletnikoff. Boletnikoff had been shut out and intimidated by New York's fiery cornerback, Johnny Sample, in the first period. While Sample may have won the fight, Boletnikoff won the war. Number 25 would lead the Raiders to their first score early in the second period. Quarterback Darrell LaMonica relied heavily on Bolitnikoff during the touchdown drive. He and number 35, set back Hewitt Dixon, were to be LaMonica's only effective weapons, however, throughout the game. After Dixon's 20-yard run with a flare pass, Bolitnikoff again broke loose in the secondary for the Raiders' initial score. A repeat of the play shows Bolitnikoff's pattern contained neither great moves nor great speed. All he did was avoid an attempted tackle and an attempted trip by two Jet defenders, neither of which seemed to phase him. Down by three, the Raiders had finally seen their first ray of sun. The touchdown must have given Oakland's defense an emotional lift for the ensuing jet drive. They blocked Namus' passes. They broke down his iron pocket and forced him to scramble on two fragile knees. And they took him to the soggy ground for the first and only time in the game. Not only did they stop Broadway Joe, they stopped his entire game plan by containing the running of Emerson Boozer and Matt Snell and preventing the long bomb to his deep receivers. A completion to number 83 George Sauer did keep the drive going, but on a third down play, a pass to tight end Pete Lamons fell far short of a first and Jim Turner had to salvage the drive with a field goal. The Raiders were now confident that even when Namath was on target, they could prevent him from scoring a touchdown. Broadway Joe would ultimately shatter this confidence. On the following kickoff, the Raiders received their only real break of the game. 
George Atkinson seemingly fumbled, but the whistle blew the ball dead and Oakland retained possession. LaMonica quickly moved his team into New York territory, again having success with a flare pass to Dixon. But here marked the beginning of what was to be the key to defeat for the Raiders. Their inability to cross the goal line once inside the Jets' 20. This was the first of five such opportunities in the game. All but one would fail. George Blanda's field goal made it 13-10 with only minutes left in the half. There would be no more scoring for either team. Oakland got the ball back, but the whistle ended the half with LaMonica awaiting the snap and the Jets awaiting the third quarter, ahead by three points. The first half had seen both teams erratic, in which neither offense was able to control the ball for long periods of time. But the tenor of the game would change radically in the third quarter. The Jets would have the ball twice, the Raiders only once. Oakland's defense was charged up for the third quarter, and they stopped the Jets' goal after the kickoff. But their efforts were negated when Roger Bird fumbled the punt return right into Bake Turner's hands. Unruffled by a seemingly fatal turn of events, the Raiders' defense closed the door on Namus' offense. From his own six-yard line, LaMonica would again take the Raiders to the brink of New York's goal line, and he would do it exclusively through the air. Oakland's ground game by now had become ineffectual, but Belitnikov was unstoppable. The last play was not only dependent on Belitnikov's catch and breakaway move for its success. His co-receiver, number 81, Warren Wells, laid a crushing crossbody block on safety Jim Hudson that afforded Bolitnikov extra yardage. Used mainly as a decoy until now, Wells then turned receiver on the next play, and the Raiders would have a first and goal on the sixth. But the Jets' defense refused to budge. Jim Hudson made three straight tackles, and the Raiders could move only to the two. Now midway through the period, Coach Rauch refused to gamble on fourth and two. Blanda's field goal tied the score at 13. The rest of the third quarter belonged to Joe Namath. on a brilliantly executed, time-consuming drive that would take seven minutes. Namath engineered his team 80 yards to a touchdown. How did he do it? Namath did it by making four crucial third-down plays to keep the drive going. He first hit Emerson Boozer, sprung free by Sauer's screen block for 12 yards and a first down. He then utilized the running of Matt Snell, who gained 25 yards on this drive and made the second crucial third down play. He took advantage of a play that almost ended the drive, a near interception. He 
get John Maynard on a third and nine play with a perfect pass good for another first down. And finally, he made the big play, the touchdown. Again on a third down call. A flat pass to tight end Pete Lamons who rolled into the end zone and gave the Jets a 20 to 13 lead at the end of the third quarter. For the first time since early in the game, Joe Namath had shown how devastating he and the Jets' offense could really be. Fifteen minutes to play and a touchdown behind. The Raiders again ease their way into the shadow of the Jets' end zone. Boletnikov beat Johnny Sample for 57 yards soon after the quarter began. On the last play, Sample went for an early fake that allowed the Raiders' receiver a step. But Sample made a good recovery after the catch to prevent a touchdown. Then it would happen again. For the third time in the game, the Jets defense met LaMonica's challenge and denied the Raiders their goal line. The tragedy for Oakland on this third down play was that Wells had sneaked free behind the secondary, but the pass instead went to Dixon and was easily batted away and almost intercepted by Jim Hudson. The Jets gave up three points but had prevented seven, which must have disheartened the Raiders. Namath then made his only mistake of the game as he was intercepted by George Atkinson. Only a rare tackle by Namath himself saved a score. <laughs> Namath's mistake on the pass was obvious. He hung the ball up a hair too long and Atkinson had a good angle to easily steal the pass away from Maynard. <laughs> This time, the Raiders made good their challenge. Pete Banizak sliced through the line and into the end zone. The decision not to use Banizak more often in the game hurt the Raider attack. He demonstrated a singular ability to break tackles, and here gave Oakland their first and last lead of the game, 23-20. Joe Namath awaited the ensuing kickoff with anticipation. He had eight minutes to regain the lead. It would take him exactly 68 seconds. Earl Christie's return set Namath up at the 32-yard line. First and ten, George Sauer on a quick sideline pattern for a first down. On the play, defender Willie Brown was protecting against the long pass, and Sauer easily made the catch. Then it was Don Maynard's turn. Maynard made a great over-the-shoulder catch 52 yards away, and the Jets were suddenly at the Raider 12. Maynard appeared to have bobbled the catch but a replay will show that he did have possession for the required length of time on a magnificent effort that set up the winning touchdown. Namath 
Smith refused to probe the defense. He went directly for a score. Seeing George Sauer covered, Namath slipped, regained his balance, and fired a rifle pass to Don Maynard through three defenders for the crucial touchdown of the game. Namath and Maynard have proved themselves as poised a combination under pressure as the AFL had ever seen. Thus far, a tense and exciting game, the drama had only just begun. Following New York's go-ahead touchdown, the Raiders again quickly approached the Jets' goal line. But again, they could not unlock the door. Fourth down, and with six minutes to play, Rouch this time chose to disdain the field goal. The strategy backfired. The man who made the last play was Verlin Biggs, number 86, who came crashing in from the right to end another Raider threat. Time and opportunity were now slipping away from the silver and black. With three minutes left, another opportunity and another failure would come to haunt the Raiders. Passes to Bolitnikov and Wells, plus a piling on penalty, gave them a first down on the 12. Monica called for a flare pass to set back Charlie Smith. A good call in this situation, but the play was executed poorly. Considered a free ball, but not advanceable, the Jets took possession at the point of recovery, and with it took the last real hope of victory from Oakland. bears at their own funeral, the Raiders and their coach silently watched New York run out the clock. Fate dealt its last blow to Oakland when on third down, Boozer's fumble gracefully bounced back into his own hand. Yet a courageous defense had contained the Jets, and Oakland would have one final chance. With all their timeouts gone, only a miracle could save the Raiders, the kind that had occurred six weeks earlier in the Heidi Bowl. Today, that miracle would not come. to the bitter end, the final play must have seemed like an eternity. At 3.30 Eastern Standard Time, a champion was crowned. The Jets had closed the door on Oakland's offense when it had counted most and well deserved their first league title. For the Raiders, it was a heartbreaking loss that would be remembered for a long time. But as the sun began to fade behind Shea Stadium's west wall, others would remember a game that produced pro football's world champion.
Once again, the Flushing Meadows faithful look to Joe Willie White Shoes to lead their Jets to victory over the powerful Oakland Raiders. Joe Namath, the AFL's leading passer, pitted his gimpy knees and whiplash arm against the Raiders' Daryl LaMonica, who is just as formidable and has thrown twice as many touchdown passes this season. Both teams have powerful front lines that are equally effective at limiting the run or smashing down the quarterback before he can cut loose the football. In the first quarter, Charlie Smith followed number 70, Jim Harvey, to a 26-yard gauge. Then LaMonica connected with Warren Wells, who accelerated past Cornell Gordon at the goal line, and Oakland drew first blood. Namath tied the game on a pass to Bake Turner, who spun free of Nemai Wilson's futile tackle and dashed to the Jets' first score. Warren Wells averages an incredible 25 yards every time he catches a pass. And even double coverage by the Jets did not affect his free-form ability to shake loose for huge gains. A bit of artful deception by LaMonica gave the Raiders a 14-7 bulge in the second quarter. Then the gifted Oakland quarterback connected with Wells for his 30th touchdown pass of the season as the Raiders' lead grew to 21-7. A Namath pass to Bake Turner led to the Jets' last score of the game as a talented Raider defense shut them out for the final two periods. Oakland traveled up and down Shea Stadium in the second half, but could not manage a touchdown. Twice, George Blanda bailed them out with field goals that ensured a 27-14 victory over the stumbling and unimpressive world champion Jets. If a Hollywood director conceived and put on film what coach John Madden and the Oakland Raiders are accomplishing for real, the movie-going public would freak. But against the Jets at Shea Stadium, it truly looked as if the Raiders had run out of miracles. The Jets, with number 32 Emerson Boozer alive and kicking, ran successfully as Boozer gulped 115 yards. But the elements and good defense combined, and the Jets led by only 3-0 at halftime. In the third quarter, New York's defense provided the spark. W.K. Hicks, number 33, intercepted a pass and slid 19 yards to the Raiders 16. From there, Woodall threw a perfect pass to Pete Lammons, number 87, and the Jets led 10 to nothing. The Raiders finally scored late in the third quarter when George Blanda hit Warren Wells. But the Jets seemed destined to win. Al Atkinson made the Jets' second interception. Jim Turner kicked a field goal. And the Jets had a seemingly comfortable lead, 13 to 7. <laughs> 
But with eight seconds left, it happened again. LaMonica's desperation heave found Warren Wells in the end zone, and the Jets had been just another victim in a long line of Oakland miracle finishes. The Raiders 14, the Jets 13. From the Goodyear Blimp, Columbia, on a beautiful, cool night, this is the scene at the Oakland Coliseum in Oakland, California. Nearly 55,000 fans jamming the Coliseum. And tonight, it's the New York Jets versus the Oakland Raiders. ABC's NFL Monday Night Football is brought to you by Right Guard Natural Scent Antiperspirant, the great wetness fighter with the light, clean scent made from natural ingredients. Right Guard Natural Scent. And by Ford and your Ford dealers. See all the better ideas for 73 at your Ford dealers. Yes, the scene is set in the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum, and we're at that time of the year where the standings speak for themselves. Look at them. The New York Jets at 7-5. and five. If they could beat Oakland tonight and Cleveland, their opponent this coming Sunday, the Jets would be the AFC wildcard team in the forthcoming playoffs. But look at Cleveland. If Cleveland can beat their opponent, the Jets, on Sunday, and if Cleveland and Pittsburgh should lose to San Diego, Cleveland would win the Central Division and Pittsburgh would be the wildcard entrant. And Oakland doesn't want to play Miami in the playoffs in their first game. So they want the Jets eliminated. That's their motivation tonight. Hello again, everyone. I'm Howard Cosell. Welcome to our final Monday night of NFL football for the year 1972. The stakes are high, especially for the Jets, and we hope for an exciting encounter. But frankly, the Jets' hopes ride on Joe Willie Namath because of injured backs. And Namath has a strep throat. If he goes out, or at least a very bad and scratchy throat and chills, if he goes out, Bob Davis, number 15 from the University of Virginia, will be his replacement. Right now, to fill you in in detail on the Jets, with his 176 rabbit skins, the incomparable Dan Daru. Thanks a lot, Howard. You're getting kind of jazzy, too. I like that black turtleneck. California must do it to him. Talking about the Jets, it's been a kind of confusing year for them. The pass seems to be the thing that's caused the most trouble. They lead the league in passing. They also lead the league in passing against them. That means they're number one throwing and number 13 keeping other folks from throwing. They have had a lot of injuries, as Howard mentioned, on defense in particular. They haven't really been too good back there. They've had some. Steve Tennant's been hurt. Holloway's been hurt. John Elliott's been hurt. He's been back. You can go right on down the list. So it's been a thing of injuries. People have come from all over to see this ball game, though, because Joe Willie has a way of attracting a crowd like that. In fact, Jeff and Hazel, Meredith from Mount Vernon, Texas, are here, and I just thought y'all might like to know that. It was Jeff's first plane trip, and he's having a lot of fun. Going to see a good ball game. We'll get into more, de more details as the game comes along. Jet Forty will me to tell you his mother's here also. But right now, Frank Gifford's going to tell us about those Oakland Raiders because they've already won them a place in that playoff berth. They look pretty good, too, don't they, Frank? Yes, they do, Don, and that, those rabbits almost made the season. <laughs> The Oakland Raiders can play this game relaxed, if you can call it that. They'd like to win it, as Howard mentioned. Uh, maybe Miami might be tougher than the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers have come on. They are dynamite. But if the Oakland Raiders can eliminate the New York Jets from the competition, they will not have to face the Miami Dolphins, the undefeated Dolphins. The Oakland Raiders have a very well-balanced football team. They're rated fourth in the AFC in defense. They're rated third in offense. And probably the reason they're doing so well on offense is Daryl LaMonica. In the past, Daryl Monica has had interceptions. A year ago, he finished the season with 16, and thus far this year, it's a new Daryl Monica. He's not going up on top with the bomb all the time, and he's thrown for only eight interceptions. They have 
two great receivers. And, of course, Fred Boletnikoff leaves the American Football Conference with 48 receptions. And then they have Raymond Chester, and he is something special. You're going to enjoy watching him tonight. Two great tight ends tonight that just, of course, have their own Rich Caster. On defense, one of the finest secondaries you're going to find anywhere, and it is a very balanced football team, these open Raiders. The thing to watch for tonight, I would think, would be those two tight ends from either team. And we'll be back at the Oakland Coliseum right after this message. Once and for all, which big screen color TV really has the best picture? The answer, Zenith Super Chroma Color. Opinion Research Corporation lined up the six leading color TVs with all identification hidden and asked more than 2,000 people from all over America to vote for the best picture. Zenith was the winner by more than two to one over the next best brand. Zenith Super Chroma Color. See the difference for yourself at your Zenith dealer. The solid 73 Ford Torino. Can it ride over this course of 2 by 4 smoothly enough to keep a tightrope walker balanced on top? High wire specialist Bill Couch is about to find out on a tightrope rigged to Torino's body. He's counting on Torino's suspension to soak up the bumps and keep him safely on that wire. Bill signals, and they're off. Those wheels are taking quite a pounding, but Bill isn't, as Torino's remarkable suspension does its job. The 1973 Ford Torino, the solid midsize that gives you confidence on the road. Incredibly smooth riding, stable, strong, and quiet. Because it's a Ford. The new 1973 Ford Torino at your Ford dealers now. Ford Torino, the solid midsize. Back at the Oakland Coliseum in Oakland, California, we're expecting quite a football game because when the Jets and the Raiders have met, historically, it has been something else. People recall the 1967 meeting when Ben Davidson tried to realign the profile of Joe Namath. And then, of course, the 68 meeting. Well, as a little girl named Heidi interrupted that one, 65 seconds left to go. It looked like the Jets had it locked up. And the Oakland Raiders, in 65 seconds, came back and scored two touchdowns to win it. And there is Joe Willie coming out. He obviously will be starting. This is a, well, how more important could it be for the Jets? They have to win. They have to win tonight. They have to beat Cleveland to assure themselves of a wild card berth. And they can do it. And you saw the Jets were received to your left. But again, there have been some historic clashes in this game. In this series, there is no love lost between the two. And whether or not... Anything was at stake. These two teams really get with it. Excitement here in Oakland. Of course, they clinched their division last week against San Diego. Next week, they'll wind up their season against the Chicago Bears, waiting, of course, to have the determination of who they will need in the playoffs. George Blanda, 23 years of competition. And this man is really a package. He still does the conversions and the field goal kicking for the Oakland Raiders. And joining us tonight for our national anthem, well, he's an awfully good golfer, too, singing and recording star, Glenn Campbell. Our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we Banner 
Camel and last week, Lou Rawls, two great performing artists. This telecast is presented by authority of the Oakland Raiders Football Club. It's intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the expressed written consent of the Oakland Raiders Football Club and the National Football League is prohibited. And we're about to get underway. The Oakland Raiders will be kicking off as their special unit comes onto the field. Jerry DePoister is number four. He handles the kickoffs. Dropping deep, Chris Ferrisopoulos on the left. And on the right is Hank Bajorklin, number 40. Ferrisopoulos, number 19. And you'll hear a lot of excitement tonight fans are relaxed. The Raiders have clinched the AFC's Western Division. They would like to win this one tonight because they would like to play in sunny Miami. And this will go to the rookie from Princeton, the Darkland. to the 25 comes Hank Majorkland. A 26-yard return. The starting lineup for the New York Jets. And we're taking just a moment to make sure it indeed will be Joe Namath. And yes, it will. Number 12. He's the quarterback. We told you he was suffering from a scratch throat. As we look at an injured Oakland Raider, that's Jeff Queen from Oregon State. Jeff Queen down on the 25-yard line. <laughs> Waiting in the offensive huddle. There you see the veteran, number 13, Don Maynard, who quite possibly set a new NFL record tonight. He needs seven receptions to break the record held by Raymond Barry. Number 13, the tight end is Big Rich Caster, of whom we smoked a few moments ago. Number 88, 6'5", 228 out of Jackson State. And Eddie Bell, little Eddie Bell, will start at the other wide receiving spot. In the, well, the injury rack running back department, the Jets have activated Emerson Boozer tonight, number 32. He is opening along with Steve Harkey, number 36. Harkey, a second-year man out of Georgia Tech. John Riggins, of course, had surgery last week, minor surgery to his knee, but he's unable to go tonight. It's a good offensive line. It's a good offensive team. They're fifth in rushing, they're first in passing, they're second in the AFC. And now Jeff Queen comes off. That offensive line for the Jets, John Schmidt is the veteran center. Dave Herman, 67, the right guard. Randy Rasmussen, 66, he's on the left guard position. Bob Sweetis, 76, and Winston Hill, 75 with the tackles. And now we're ready to get underway. First and 10, Joe Willie Namath, the quarterback. Moving from the 25. it to the right, ball to the left. Going out, pass intended for Don Maynard and Namaya Wilson was there. Namaya Wilson at the left cornerback, 48. George Atkinson at the tight safety, 43. Jack Tatum is the free safety, number 31. Willie Brown, 24, the right cornerback. They make up a fine secondary. Dan Connors in the middle, 55. Phil Villapiano on the left side, 41. And Gerald Irons, 86, the right linebacker. Second down and 10 from the 25. Just underway from Oakland, California. Maynard right, Eddie Bell out left. Namath, little protection, goes out to Caster and he took his eyes off him. Oh boy. Well, the first one was almost picked off for a touchdown by Namaya Wilson and this one saw Caster returning to a game he once enjoyed known as dropsies. Look at that split screen replay. All alone, yardage to be picked up right through the hands. Nobody near him, no crowd around. Nobody could say was listening for the footsteps. 
Let's take a look at the roly-poly veteran coach, Weeb Eubank, the only man to win it all in both leagues. And what he's watching is Joe Namath on a third and ten call from the 25. Both wide receivers, Bell and Maynard, go out to the right. The tight end, Caster, with a lot of speed, is on the left side. Namath looking for Boozer. He has Boozer, and Boozer will be short of the first down, hit very hard by little Nehemiah Wilson. Boozer was just activated this week, Frank, and he has played some good football for those Jets. He came up about a foot short that time. They're going to, it appears early that they're going to give him the short stuff because Caster was about in that same area. And it also appears that Namath is going to throw and throw and throw and throw with Riggins and McLean injured and Boozer perhaps rusty from two weeks of inactivity because of a hyperextension of his knee. All right, this is O'Neill. He'll do the punting. And he'll be kicking deep to a single safety man with a short man in front. Branch is the up-close man. Oh, and just getting it off. Short kick. Not a big bounce for the Jets on a very, well, we won't call it very soggy, but it is a slow field. All right, the Oakland Raiders, the champions of the Western Division of the AFC, will take over possession. And they move with their number one quarterback in the AFC, Daryl LaMonica, their setbacks, Marv Hubbard. He's approaching 1,000 yards. He has 941. Clarence, or rather Charlie Smith now, at number 23, is the other setback. Hubbard, 44, Smith, 23, and this is Monica. First and 10 from the 28. Hubbard, over the 35 to the 37 goes Marv Hubbard. Goes Hubbard again. Breaking a tackle, and he spins and twists to the 48-yard line, Marv Hubbard. And he's working Marv Hubbard. This time, Hubbard is tripped up. 23, Hubbard 44. Hubbard gets the call, and he gets the first down. Down and 10. The Jets have four linebackers. Eversole is in. The draw play. Marv Hubbard. Good hole. Elliott recovers, makes a stop at the 40, and the ball is fumbled, but recovered by Oakland. Something coverage, as you see, the top of the screen. Going for Boletnikoff, and dangerous in that kind of coverage. Boletnikoff working against Tanner. Tannen, and Tannen was there. From the 46, the 23 year veteran George Blanda. Holds all the scoring records, gets it off. Rocky Turner is watching it go through. The Raiders move out in front three to nothing. And this is the man, he's 45 years old. We'll be back at the Open Coliseum right after this message. And from the 22, Bell goes out to the left, picks up Brown. And Bell gets the completion and he moves out to the 41 yard line, covered there by Willie Brown, but little. Eddie Bell is a man you have to really respect for his feet. Ball just short of his own 42, but it's Bell left. Maynard, the all-time leading yardage receiver, up to the right. Looking for Maynard. And he has it. Absolutely perfectly oh, thrown again. That is throwing the football. Pretty to see. Now, Gerald Irons, 86, jumps out of it. Amos right on target again, oh. and beautiful in that zone defense, and Maynard is doing a fine job working it behind the Amaya Wilson and ahead of George Atkinson. All right, let's watch him work, and also watch just as Maynard turns, the ball is already thrown. The Amaya Wilson is going back, protecting against the deep. You see deep zone, you see Viviano coming out, number 41. He turns, that ball is there. I don't care what kind of defense they're in, they're not going to stop that one. Well, the best games have been fun, the players haven't felt well. And here comes Harkey as the flag goes down. Frank, that's a good point. Uh, a lot of times when guys don't feel at their top of their game, they, they really do feel a... In Oakland offside twice so far tonight, based upon that hitch as the linemen straighten up the up. This is Harkey, and Harkey is inside the five to the three. Jerome Barkham is in for Maynard. Uh, oh, Joe. Oh. And Joe lost his footing on that turf. He doesn't have the best of knees, as I think every sports fan in America is aware of. Coverage with Willie Brown. Top of your screen, you did not see it. Maynard, bottom of your screen, he's being covered by Nemaya Wilson. Oh! Picked off by Willie Brown, and Joe Namath could not resist that single coverage he saw. He probably... He's upset at, uh, yeah. Brett Bell is who he's upset with. Frank, that was a really, truly a... Uh, 
Sounds like this is a Joe Namath night for me, but that ball was well, well thrown again. Told you, it's heavy. Low kick. Turner has it, and he gets back to about the 39-yard line. Jerome Barkham out. Third down and 21, the ball at midfield. Hope backs again, coming out of the backfield. Caster, and Rich Caster has it. He may go all the way. And a good block from Maynard. What a block by John Maynard. You're right, Frank. He really poured it on. 50 yards. Rich Caster, his hit touchdown of the year. This is the toughest situation in the world. Hit a long pass. Third down and long yardage. Watch it come back. Good shot here on the ground. Watch this good protection again. And look at the ball. Right over their heads. And here's Maynard, number 13. Watch him. He sees it. Caster has it. Out of his screen, he throws a good block. Look at Caster go. 50 yards and a touchdown. I think that was a setty rather than Lewis, though. I'm going with the setty. I'll tell you, these two teams play some games, as Frank mentioned earlier, through all the years. First and 10, the Raiders from their own 37. LaMonica now drawing a crowd, but he's flying deep to Belitnikoff. It'll be picked off. That's Steve Tannen. And he's picking up blockers. He really is that. Mike Ciani after him over there, and Mike got him. Steve Tannen all the way back to the Raiders 40-yard line. Finally dropped by Ciani. He, he returned, returned that 31 yards. yards. He's the other back, 36. Big draw, looking for Eddie Bell. And it's picked up, it is. No, no, out of bounds. And he had to come down inbounds with both feet. Did Willie Brown. Let's take a look. He is a beautiful athlete to watch, Willie Brown. Watch him there with Eddie Bell. He's playing his man. He sees the cut, sees Bell, goes up. Now let's watch him. He catches the ball. He's way up in the air. Now watch him come down. Both feet have to be in. It looks that left foot is going out, and it did. Good call by that ref. From the 39, Howfield. He's got plenty of leg. He kicked six of them last week, but he misses. And meanwhile, Bob Davis thought he made it. Bob Davis the holder, but no. Just to again, split to the right. He has the speed of a wide receiver. And he collects it like a wide receiver, and Steve Cannon makes a stop, but it's first down Oakland. Ebersole has come in. The moving pocket. Monica going for Charlie Smith, and he holds on, and I believe he has the first down. Yes, he does. Just over the 50-yard line into jet territory goes Charlie Smith. And Chris Ferrisopoulos. And here comes Hubbard. Charlie Smith with the block out in front. And Hubbard hurdles all the way down to the 43-yard line. Second down and four. Got a thousand and five now, or a three. I started to say a while ago, this young man was cut. He went back and worked it out in the minor leagues, came back, and has really become the workhorse of this backfield. It'll be on to Miami and the undefeated Dolphins. On first and ten, LaMonica. And he's going up in the air to Belitnikoff, and he's open. He got it. That one was thrown right on the money, I guarantee. He could not have been better thrown. Come back, he's trying to help him. On split screen, let's watch it again. The Mad Bombers, he called, really unleashed that one. And look at the letter call. Right out in front of Tennant. Now look at him. Never, never broke stride. It appears that Tennant is sliding and he may have, you know, I don't, he may have hurt one of his shoulder that we mentioned earlier. Open Coliseum right after this message. Again, putting both those backs out of the backfield. Out to Harkey. And Harkey upset by Phil Villapiano. Again, the back's checking for Red Dog oh, and then pretty. moving out and it goes to Caster. That's pretty. Maynard, top of your screen, just moved back. He didn't want to encroach the line of scrimmage. Both backs again out of the backfield. Maynard's open. And Tatum saved the touchdown. Jack Tatum. Maynard all the way down to the 26-yard line of the Raiders. For hockey, second down and seven. Ball inside the 25. Maynard this time holding both backs in. That usually means he's going to try and go deep, but he checks off to Maynard. And Maynard picked up a spell at the piano, and this is a rough cookie. At the 20, mark it at the 18, and Maynard will put it in the air again. And intended for Maynard again. And covering and covering well, number 48, Namaya Wilson. Defeated Dolphins. And the Jets, well, they have to win it or they can forget it. 25. 
Good. It's all tied up. Bobby Halfield from 25 yards out. This first down for the Oakland Raiders from the 24. La Monica finds Charlie Smith. Charlie Smith very close to a first down up to the 34-yard line. Second down, you saw how much. 155 remaining in the half. Charlie Smith on the screen. Cuts it back. He gets the first down and he gets out over the 40 to the 41. Off of your screen, Siani trying to get the call from La Monica. Oletnikov faking the deep pattern. He slips the ball, but he recovers on a great move. And, well, you hate to overdo it, but Fred Oletnikov is something else. It will lead to the Jets because it's all over if they don't win it. All right, first down and 10. Just inside the 40, La Monica is going to go deep to Chester, and he attracts a lot of... Who is that, Tannen? Yeah, Tennant almost made an unbelievable interception, Frank. He didn't. It appears that he's hurt again. Right in the same place, Don. Yep. That's not a good corner for old Steve tonight. But he was out to the right in front of Rick Sowles. Sandy on the inside. And right away. And Sowles gets the interception. <laughs> he checked him out. And he and checked Sowles him got out. a pretty good hand. And he came through. <laughs> but that's what he was trying to do. You're absolutely right. Number 88 is on the right side. His name again. Chris Bogle's back's out. Oh, me. Eddie Bell wide open right in the slot between those three men, and you saw a great picture of the zone defense. The Jets just playing deep, but they keep their 4-3 alignment. Now, now they're in a three-man front four. They send it to Harkey and almost picked off by Dan Connors. That branch is deep. This will be... Well, the attempt at the fair catch by Davis, anyway. and wait a minute... The Jets recovered are inside the 25. And it would give the Jets a three-point lead. It's tied up right now with 13 seconds remaining in the half at 10 apiece. It's good. And unless they run the kickoff back, the Jets are going to go to the locker room. 13 to 10 over the Raiders. And that is the end of the first half. The New York Jets out in front of the Oakland Raiders, 13 to 10. And we'll be back with highlights from yesterday after this. Hubbard picks up three. It'll be second down and seven. The ball at the 28-yard line. Tough man out of Florida. He's back at the left corner. This on second down. Here comes Charlie Smith. And Charlie Smith rolls out for yardage enough for the first down. Over the 30 to the 31. And here's our... Steve Tannen, our third-year man out of Florida, leads the Jets in interceptions. He went down twice in the first half. Raiders just underway in the second half. And here comes Hubbard again, and Hubbard pounds out to the 40. Chester on the left side, number 87. Big tight end. This will go to Belitnikoff right in the seam of that zone defense, and Belitnikoff picks up the first down, moves into Jet territory at the 44. Second down now at 7. Both backs coming out of the backfield, looking for Belitnikoff. He has it again, and they're eating that zone alive on the left side. The 25-yard line. Charlie Smith finds a big hole. Inside the 20 goes Charlie Smith. Number 45, early Thomas, saved a touchdown. That's the team they would like to avoid, I'm sure. They're undefeated. And if they win tonight, they will not have to face Miami. This is Hubbard, and he breaks loose. He's inside the 10 to the 7. Mark it at the 8, Marv Hubbard. Hubbard behind Otto and Beeler. All the way down inside the five. He'll be at the three. Marv Hubbard. Elliott. One first down and goal. Hubbard gets the call again. He'll be very close to the touchdown. Jets in their goal line defense. Number 71 is John Mooring. The one. Smith gets the call. Touchdown open. Oakland regaining the lead. 14 plays. The Raiders moving out in front of the New York Jets, 17 to 13, on the toe of the senior citizen of pro football, George Blanda. Will try and take over, and he'll have to move it 88 yards. The Jets now trailing the Raiders, 17 to 13. Namath has been using his backs out of the backfield all night. Over the middle it goes to his big tight end, Rich, Crest, Rich Kester. Both back circling out. Little Eddie Bell comes up with it. And he's out over the 30 to the 31. It is out to the right. 
Looking for Maynard complete. And Gerald Irons saved what could have been a much longer game. Looking for Maynard complete. That's it. That's Inside size the it. 25 to the 22. What a night that veteran is having. 75 yards and that one touchdown. The end around to the tight end, Rich Caster. There's a flag, flag is down right in the middle and don't speculate, but that generally holding. involves holding. It's the break that Oakland needed. Referee Jim Tunney, the bottom of your screen. We're going for Maynard, and he had his man beat. He had Nemiah Wilson beat. He's kicked two tonight. 125 and 130. He kicked six last week. And he's kicked another one tonight. Three tonight. So the lead is short to the Raiders. 17, the New York Jets in a must game for them. The 17-16, and we'll be back after this. The Raiders at this point, third down, less than a yard, 9.35 remaining. LaMonica switches up, Chester's wide open. And he can run. That's it, great call. Norman's defense. 69 yards, Raymond Chester, as Daryl LaMonica came up with the play fake. The Jets cocked and ready for the attempt at the first down, but totally off guard. Completely. Amateurishly. Through all the years they've watched Bart Starr do this, take another look at it. Yep, he was wide open. They were expecting that run. The Raiders have been running very well. No one was in about 10 yards of Raymond Chester. He hadn't even opened it up yet. And we'll be back at the Oakland Coliseum in Oakland, California, right after this message. First, they know what Namath has to do, and he's going to do it right now. Up in the air it goes to Maynard. And that broke it. That's Maynard the over the 45, record. and that breaks that record. Wouldn't you think what? they'd stop the, the play and give him the ball or something? This man has spent 14 years of his life and has established a record. Look at that split screen now. Right in there. Now thrown seven to Don Maynard. We told you he broke the record of Ray Berry. Now on first and ten, going to the air, and Eddie Bell complete. Eddie Bell all the way down to the 30, and, well, I hope it doesn't sound like we're all Joe Namath no, it fans, doesn't. but he is incredible. That's the point I wanted to make, Frank. It's that man. Second down and ten from the 30. And he gets it out this time to number 32, Emerson Boozer. Left, Caster's a tight end on the left side, 88. Eddie Bell, and it will be picked off by Tatum, Jack Tatum. Jack Tatum, took it all the way down to the 43-yard line, fumbled the ball, I believe the referee has indicated Recovered by the Jets. One referee said the Jets had it. One had the uh, Raiders had it. The head referee says the Raiders still have it. I guess that's the way it goes. Now they're arguing about it. Well, we're in Oakland. <laughs> Raiders now leading 24 to 16. Grantham makes the stop. And here we go. Oh, I'll tell you. Oh, don't do that, Phil Wise. Falling apart now, an absence of discipline. There's no point to that, no excuse for it. Number 16. Here comes Davis. And Davis is upended at the 15 yard line. Hubbard down to the 10. Frank, as we approach the end of our Monday night NFL season, and now in seven, they're on the 10 yard line. This is Clarence Davis. Spinning and turning, he's down to five yard line. Phil Wise making the move. 316 remaining in the game. He chews a lot of gum too. He missed it. <laughs> well, maybe wish he had the five back. Second down and 10 from the 20. Again, time to throw, a flag goes down as a Raider really unloaded on a jet. I think that was Villapiano, and they Maynard, Maynard was the one that was uh, the recipient of, I think, a Villapiano 
clothesline, if I'm not mistaken, Frank. We'll take a look at it. They did throw a flag. Let's see. Here's Maynard number 13. Let, who is that? Wham. That is Villapiano. Just a quick shot to the jaw. And then I'm going to step on him. You know, I know what Namath has to be thinking. The, the big man, Arkham, is in in the four-end offense of the Jets at this point. Three-man rush for the Raiders. Flag is down. Namath going to Caster and is picked off. But hold on, the flag is down. I think the Raiders were offside, and I think the play will be called back. 2.55 remaining in the game. Flags go down, complete to Eddie Bell. But again, the flags in the middle of the line of scrimmage. I think this is against Winston Hill, number 75, for Holden. Green is in the slot. Lone back, Harkey. And the firing, and this time almost picked off. Gerald Irons, number 86, and almost picked it off, and Namath is shaken up. Namath is hurt. What's the ball? It appeared it was almost intercepted. Irons back around. It did go right through the hands of number 86 for the Oakland Raiders, and that would be Gerald Irons. Namath appears to be. He just no. He gestured to, he gestured to, to the bench there. and said that I went out sent last year filling in for Namath. He has a job cut out and this time he goes down. He was trying to go deep. Did not have time. Racing in there was Otis Sistrunk, number 60. And he is going to get the wide out. Oakland pass rush. They know he has to go to the air. And in and out of the hands. Incomplete. Little Bobby Bell or rather Eddie Bell could not hold on. And Davis upset. Clock showing 2.34. Look who's coming back. And Joe Namath is coming back in. Be the ball game. That's in there. Well, how about it? Well, complete down to the 36-yard line is complete to, I believe, Barkham. Barkham, Bell, Caster, Namath back trying, he's going to go down. Down he goes at the 48-yard line. A lot of pressure in there. Now it's third down and 31, and Eddie Bell leaves the game. Six receptions, 89 yards. Joe Namath went out of the game, shaken up, and now he comes with the screen and is almost picked off by Tony Klein. Jets. Good protection. Joe throws it as far as he can to Markham. And he caught the football, deflected, I believe. Yep. That has to be one of the unbelievable oh. catches. And look at Joe. Hold on. He says, we still have a chance. Jerome Barkham. Oh. Yes, look again. again. Frankie throws it up. I believe that was Tatum that came over him at 31. He just bounced out of their hands, and Barkham caught it and kept going. Let's look at it from the other angle. We'll see if we can pick it up a little bit better for you. You take a look. Again, we told you in 1968, look at that catch. The Jets were leading to the left. Well, and and Markham caught the ball. He will not get it over the line, but there is a flag down. There will probably be some kind of interference call, whether it's offensive or defensive. We'll wait and see. Stop the clock. Anyway, Frank, against the Jets. The number seven gunslinger of all time, Daryl LaMonica. Seven is Daryl LaMonica. Why? Gunslinger, Daryl LaMonica? Next. Daryl LaMonica is on the list of the top ten gunslingers? Holy cow! That shows you how many people don't know what they don't know. Yes, he was a gunslinger. He could throw it, and he could sling it. I love Daryl LaMonica. He was awesome. In the 60s and early 70s, Daryl LaMonica earned his reputation as our number seven gunslinger. But his nickname is second to none. Daryl LaMonica was the Mad Bomber. The Mad Bomber. He was a Mad Bomber. The 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 Mad Bomber. Fit him perfectly. Great nickname. The meticulously designed Oakland offense then began its precision bombing of Boston's defense. Gunslinger? For sure. 
had been honed in Buffalo uh, behind Jack Kemp. Darrell LaMonica, a rookie from Notre Dame, has replaced the injured Jack Kemp. Buffalo Trail. Whoops, they did. After four seasons, Buffalo defused the Mad Bomber. Darrell was clearly a guy that wanted to throw the ball. He was traded to the Raiders. It was the perfect situation for them. Al Davis has always believed in the vertical offense. Al Davis was at his absolute innovative best at that point. Hey, look! He throws one for Belinda Cup, a fine catch at the 15. He screamed at the 46-yard line of the chase. He was such a good fit for Al Davis that I think Al never got over Darrell Monica. Throw it anywhere, at any time. But he throws! Touchdown, Raiders! Don't be afraid to throw it. It was a different era. I mean, that kind of game would never work today unless you had Mike Martz as your coach. He loved it. He loved going deep. Bill Monica was nuts. He loved to throw it long. It was fun to watch. The fences would have to open up and respect the deep threat. Buffalo learned the hard way. If your name is the Mad Bomber, you pretty much have license to drop back seven steps and chuck that puppy up. First thing he would say, well, I mean, because we're getting ready to go deep. The first play, it was a bomb. The second play, a bomb. The third play, a bomb. Anything that was under like 25 yards was an insult to his arm. Oakland's receivers were tailor-made for LaMonica's talents. LaMonica would drop back, and so many times, he'd just throw it deep, and Wells would run under it. They had Warren Wells and Daryl LaMonica. Forget about it. LaMonica's back. Hey, look, he's throwing deep for Wells. Monica won more than 78% of his games as a starter. Only Otto Graham has done better. But LaMonica's basic game plan fell apart as defenses became more complex. He just couldn't get it. Don't worry about that. You just run your back. Those zones drove him crazy. We I mean, throw an interception. That's his weakness here. <laughs> he didn't read the play right in the defense. This Maverick is hardly a unanimous choice for our number seven gunslinger of all time. Holy cow. Oh, my God. Another was quarterback Daryl LaMonica, who Davis traded for that offseason. Four years, a backup quarterback at Buffalo. Daryl LaMonica finally won a regular job at Oakland. Monica went on to devastate Buffalo with six touchdown passes in the first half. After a night in the hospital, Daryl LaMonica threw three touchdown passes.
Here is the last minute as it would have been seen last night if somebody at NBC had got the word. Monica to Charlie Smith. Smith is hitting and he scores. The number seven gunslinger of all time, Daryl LaMonica. Seven is Daryl LaMonica. Why? Gunslinger. Daryl LaMonica? Next. Daryl Monica is on the list of the top 10 gunslingers? Holy cow! That shows you how many people don't know what they don't know. Yes, he was a gunslinger. He could throw it, and he could sling it. I love Daryl Monica. He was awesome. In the 60s and early 70s, Daryl Monica earned his reputation as our number 7 gunslinger, but his nickname is second to none. Daryl Monica was the Mad Bomber. The Mad Bomber. He was a Mad Bomber. The 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 Mad Bomber. Fit him perfectly. Great nickname. The meticulously designed Oakland offense then began its precision bombing of Boston's defense. Gunslinger for sure. He had been honed in Buffalo uh, behind Jack Kemp. Daryl LaMonica, a rookie from Notre Dame, has replaced the injured Jack Kemp. Buffalo trail. Whoops, they did. And after four seasons, Buffalo defused the Mad Bomber. Darrell was clearly a guy that wanted to throw the ball. He was traded to the Raiders. It was the perfect situation for them. Al Davis has always believed in the vertical offense. Al Davis was at his absolute innovative best at that point. Hey, look! He throws one for Melinda Cuff, a fine catch at the 15. He screamed at the 46-yard line of the chase. He was such a good fit for Al Davis that I think Al never got over Daryl Monica. Throw it anywhere, at any time. But he throws! Touchdown, Raiders! Don't be afraid to throw it. A brilliant work of art by the master of his position. It was a different era. I mean, that kind of game would never work today unless you had Mike Martz as your coach. He loved it. He loved going deep. Bill Monica was nuts. He loved to throw it long. It was fun to watch. Defenses would have to open up and respect the deep threat. Buffalo learned the hard way. If your name is the Mad Bomber, you pretty much have license to drop back seven steps and chuck that puppy up. First thing he would say, warm up him because you're getting ready to go deep. The first play, it was a bomb. The second play, a bomb. Third play, a bomb. Anything that was under like 25 yards was an insult to his arm. Oakland's receivers were tailor-made for LaMonica's talents. LaMonica would drop back, and so many times, he'd just throw it deep, and Wells would run under it. They had Warren Wells and Daryl LaMonica. Forget about it. LaMonica's back. He looks. He's throwing deep for Wells in traffic. It's better room. LaMonica won more than 78% of his games as a starter. Only Otto Graham has done better. But LaMonica's basic game plan fell apart as defenses became more complex. He just couldn't get it. Don't worry about that. Just run your back. Those zones drove him crazy. When he throw an interception, that's his weakness. <laughs> he didn't read the play right in the defense. This
Thank you.